text, our first episode of this new anime begins with a girl at work, looking exhausted. She then loses consciousness and tells us that the last thing she saw and felt was the touch of her office desk. She couldn't accomplish a single thing she wanted to, and if there was another life after death, she would want to explore it eagerly. Then she dies. In another life, we see the girl reincarnated as a beautiful little girl with red hair named Dahlia. We see Dahlia approach her father while he's working and ask him what he's doing and what those things in front of him are. Her father tells her that this device is a magical device, and magical devices are used for magical purposes. In this land, everyone uses them in their daily lives because magical devices make everyone's life easier. Thus, they can cool or warm up rooms, generate light from nothing using a magic fire stone, or produce a flowing stream of water using a magic water stone. Cleaning can be done quickly using a magic wind stone. Combining things like magic stones in clever ways creates useful magical devices. Dahlia asks her father if these devices are different from magic. Her father explains that only a limited number of people can use magic well, but anyone can use magical devices. He then takes the device and makes Dahlia turn it on. Butterflies appear around them, and Dahlia is very happy with the sight. Her father tells her that this device was made by magical device craftsmen. Dahlia asks her father if she can also make magical devices like that. Her father tells her that she can, but she needs to study first and when she grows up and becomes a magical craftsman one day. Dahlia gets very excited about this. Then we see a girl named Irma looking at Dahlia's drawing, which she calls Dahlia's space. Irma tells Dahlia that the drawing is amazing. When Dahlia's father realizes that Irma is there, he welcomes her, and Irma apologizes for coming during his work time. He then tells them to go outside to play because he wants to focus on his work. Dahlia tells him that she wanted to read the monster guide with him. Irma looks at Dahlia and tells her that they should go play and leave her father's workplace. Then we see Dahlia's father holding Dahlia's drawing, saying that Dahlia is ahead of her time. Suddenly, Mrs. Sophia appears behind him and tells him that Dahlia will be very angry if he touches her things without her permission. That drawing is very important to her. The scene then shifts to Dahlia and Arma in the garden amidst the flowers. Irma asks Dahlia if she really wants to become a magical craftsman. Dahlia tells her that she is very determined and will be a magical craftsman one day. Irma asks if there is a magical device she wants. Dahlia responds that she doesn't want anything, but she wants a refrigerator. Dahlia tells her to choose something that doesn't already exist. Irma says that when she grows up, she wants to be a hairdresser, so she is practicing now on her long hair because drying it is difficult and very tiring. Dahlia, surprised, says, drying, and that's my idea. She then rushes to her father, grabs a paper, and tells him she has thought of a new magical device, a hair drying device. By using both a fire stone and a wind stone together, the warm wind would help dry hair quickly. She finishes the drawing and gives it to her father for his opinion. Her father tells her that she can't make it now, but one day when she grows up, she will be able to because she needs a bit of experience first. It's at the end of the day, the father leaves and tells Mrs. Sophie to take care of Dahlia. The scene then shifts to Dahlia's father with his friend Orlando drinking tea. He tells Orlando that his daughter Dahlia is very clever. Orlando replies that Dahlia hasn't even finished elementary school yet and already wants to learn how to make magical devices, which is a bit risky. The father says he told Dahlia that she can't use magic stones unless he is with her. Orlando warns him that children don't always heed warnings and might do things you wouldn't expect. The father assures him that his daughter Dahlia isn't like other children and will definitely become a magical craftsman in the future. While they are talking, we see Dahlia taking her things and going up to her room to start making a magical device. The father returns home and asks Mrs. Sophia what Dahlia is doing. Mrs. Sophia tells him that Dahlia played a little in the garden and then went to continue playing in her room. She informs him that she has prepared his meal and then leaves. While the father is drinking tea, he hears his daughter Dahlia screaming. He rushes to her room and sees the room on fire with Dahlia looking very scared. He quickly moves her away and uses a magical device to extinguish the fire. Then he asks her if she is okay. Delia cries a lot and her father looks around and sees the magic stones. He tells her that she cannot use magic stones unless he is beside her. Dahlia apologizes and tells him that she wanted to make a magical device secretly, but when she put the magic stones in the hair dryer, the fire burned the place. He tells her that he understands her feelings, but she must be careful because making magical devices is dangerous, and there are many things she hasn't learned yet. He reassures her that he is by her side and tells her that they will make some magical devices together. 
Dahlia is deeply moved by her father's words, hugs him tightly and cries, apologizing for what she did. We then see Dahlia with her father as he uses a fire magic device. He tells her that this device can't be used for drying hair, but the concept isn't bad. If they use a magic circle to limit the magical energy, the device could produce warm air. Dahlia tells him that she wants the device to blow both cool and warm air. Her father agrees and goes inside to figure out how to make the device. He tells her that he wants to make the device's frame from a very strong material. Dahlia asks if it's possible to control the device's speed to produce both strong and gentle winds. Her father says that's possible. If they adjust the power of the wind magic stone, it won't be too difficult. Then we see Dahlia and her father making the device together. When they finish, Dahlia takes a bath and approaches her father with wet hair. Her father turns on the device and dries her hair, then hands her a comb to brush her hair. When she finishes, Dahlia is very happy with the device. Her father tells her that there are no, no anomalies in the magic circles and no issues with the magic stones, meaning the device is complete. They sit together and drink their favorite beverages. Then Mrs. Sophia arrives, greets them, and asks why they are up so early. At that moment, Miss Sophia arrives and greets them, noticing they are up early. Dahlia runs to her and hugs her, saying, Thanks to God, we finished making the hair dryer. But she falls asleep immediately. Her father says it seems she's fallen asleep. We stayed up all night. Miss Sophia gets angry and says, How could you let a child her age stay up all night? Are you even a father? He tries to explain, saying it wasn't intentional, but they were making a magical device together and lost track of time. He then carries Dahlia and lays her on the bed to rest. He apologizes to Miss Sophia, who tells him not to apologize but expresses her concern for Dahlia. She says that if he doesn't act responsibly, who will? He reassures her, saying he loves his daughter more than anything in the world and won't let it happen again. Miss Sophia looks at the hair dryer Dahlia made and can't believe she made it herself. Her father tells her that Dahlia is naturally talented and incredibly intelligent, perhaps even more than him. He says it just takes time, but she will become truly skilled, and the world will see it. The next morning, the weather is wonderful. Dahlia wakes up, puts on her beautiful glasses, and thinks about the next device she will invent. Her father arrives, and she greets him warmly. He apologizes for being late, explaining that he met an old friend and got caught up in their conversation. Then he asks her, Are you finally trying to figure out how the crystal fairy lamp works? She replies, No, Dad, it's still too early for that lamp. Even though I understand the structure used, I can't manage a consistent magical energy flow like that yet. I think the road is still long before I become a real craftsman. Her father tells her that if she works hard, studies, and perfects her skills, she will be able to do anything. She gets up and says, Dad, let's go and have breakfast. The scene shifts to the kitchen where they are preparing breakfast together. The breakfast looks wonderful. While they eat, he asks her if she has thought of any new magical devices. She says she has had many ideas, but only thought through some of them in detail. After finishing her meal, she puts on her backpack and gets ready to visit her friend Arma. She bids her father goodbye, and he reminds her not to be late. Dahlia runs off, her eyes filled with hope. She knows the road ahead is long, and she still lacks some skills, but she is determined. The journey is not easy and requires training and experience, which her father will provide. He hopes she will become even better than him because he loves her very much. One day, with God's will, she will reach her goal. She will do everything and become a magical craftsman who can bring joy to everyone just like her father. And with that, our episode ends today. Stay tuned for the next episode. Make sure to subscribe to the channel and activate the notification bell so you don't miss any updates. Our episode begins with Dalia returning home and telling her father that MS... Elena showed them today some magic lamps used by the guards on their night patrols. These lamps are made with silver firefly wings, and their color depends on the land they came from. When she looks at her father, she sees a handsome young man named Tobias from Orlando Trading Company, who has been helping her father for some time. Dahlia greets Tobias, who tells her to call him just Tobias, without any titles, and expresses his happiness to work. Later, we see Dahlia outside the house on a rainy night, and Ivano comes rushing over. Dahlia thanks him for always helping her father, and Ivano tells her not to say that because her father is the one who takes care of him. He then asks her what brought her there, and she tells him that her father asked her to deliver some documents. Ivano suggests they go inside and rest since it's raining heavily. They go inside and drink tea together. Ivano tells her that, according to Mr. Carlo, the cold harvesting season is approaching and that her father is an amazing magic craftsman who helped in making the lamps 
and people are very grateful to him. When Mr. Carlo was here once, he told him that those lamps are amazing magical devices, and that magic craftsmen think and create, and they never see an end ahead of them. Dahlia tells him that she often hears her father say such things, as he used to tell her to create magical devices that people can safely use to enrich their daily lives and to strive to create magical devices that bring joy to people's faces. Strain, when the rain stops, Dahlia returns home and sees her father drenched from the rain. Her father tells her that he was able to see the heavy rain approaching. He asks her if she understands what he means, as he saw the boundary between where it was raining and where it wasn't coming closer, so he thought that if he ran, he might be able to outrun it. So he and Tobias ran as fast as they could, but the rain was too fast and caught up with them. Dahlia tells him that he can't outrun the rain, even if he sees it coming. Tobias tells her that they didn't get too wet thanks to her father's coats. Then Dahlia tells them that she will take their clothes to the cleaners tomorrow, because if they don't dry, they will start to smell bad. Suddenly, an idea comes to her mind to create something more effective against rain than her father's coats. Her father and Tobias are surprised, and she tells them that the coat she will make will have a useful, lightweight fabric that repels water from the body, and she will call it a raincoat. The next morning, we see Dahlia planning on paper to create the raincoat and deciding to use slime. Tobias tells her that he has never heard of using slime as a material for magic infusion. Dahlia tells him that she tried many materials, but they didn't work, so she thought about it, and although slime might be weak in terms of magic, she has an idea. Tobias asks her how she intends to apply it to the fabric. Dahlia explains that when she pierced the core of the slime and passed crock and tape through the hole, the materials didn't disintegrate. She plans to do that, dry it, turn it into a powder, dissolve it in some liquid, and then fix it to the fabric. But currently, she is thinking of experimenting with different types of slime. Dahlia says that the blue slime powder clings to the fabric but doesn't spread over large areas, so she plans to experiment with the stickier green slime. We then see Dahlia sitting with her friends, and they tell her she always talks about slime. Dahlia explains that the green slime sticks to larger areas, but the blue slime is more water-resistant. She tells them she will try a different liquid next time and gives them samples of the slime to try. She then tells Tobias that his method of applying magic is amazing. Tobias responds, Don't make fun of me. I am part of a company responsible for distributing goods, and some people find it strange. After some time, Dahlia falls asleep on the book, and her father comes down and covers her. The next day, her father suggests that instead of using just one type of solvent, she might try mixing them. Dahlia mixes the blue and green slime, uses her magic, and sees that it has adhered to the fabric. She then gives the fabric to her father. It's how it was dissolved in the liquid to compensate for the blue slime's lack of stickiness, which made it cling to the fabric. It's a very good magical device. Bravo, my dear, her father exclaimed. Then Tobias called out to her, we still have more experiments to conduct. We don't know if it was applied evenly or how long it will last. So we need to be more cautious and work harder to produce the right material. Dolly agreed. You're right, Tobias. But I'm curious to see if it will maintain its properties under harsh conditions. Also, the slime might come off at the stitching points and attachment areas, but I've already thought of a plan to address that. If we add a different powder to the attachment points beforehand, it might solve this issue. Two days later, it was officially registered as Dalia Rossetti's invention, a perfectly waterproof fabric and raincoats made from it. What wonderful magical devices. I imagine the orders will come flooding in, she thought. The scene shifts to when Dahlia and Tobias arrive home. Delia thanks Tobias profusely, but he tells her he did nothing. It was her intelligence, wisdom, and ability to focus and innovate that achieved the impossible. And now we need to inform the teacher that we registered the invention without any issues, we said. An hour after entering the house, there was a knock on the door. They were informed that they had received more orders. The demand was overwhelming, especially in winter. Everyone started working day and night, delighted to be selling and making a lot of money. They received an incredible number of orders for the waterproof fabric, which proved useful for more than just raincoats. It was also very effective as coverings for carriage roofs. When people found out that slime wasn't used in the manufacturing process, there was an increase in slime hunting. During the evening, Dahlia's father was sitting in a cafe with his friend, saying, The waterproof fabric is the talk of the town. If you hadn't mediated for us all this time, we would have faced a real disaster. This is what one would expect from the head of Orlando Trading Company. Orlando responded, Are you mocking me, man? But Dahlia's father reassured him, No, I wasn't mocking you. 
You really did save us, and your son is very smart, Orlando replied. Thank you, my dear. Dahlia's talent is also amazing. I can't wait to see what magical device she'll create next. I follow her every move, Dahlia's father then said. The problem is that Dahlia is still a young girl, and she might invent something very dangerous without realizing it. His friend replied, my dear, you have to consider that she is still young. You watch over her from afar because you are her father and you never overlook her. She is intelligent and could inadvertently cause great harm with her intellect. Just as you are concerned about your daughter, I am also very concerned about Ireno and Tobias. That's why I hope Tobias and Dalia will get married. Putting such a proposal without anything in return would be insulting to the Baron of the Hot Water Device, so I use my company as a shield to protect Dalia from any potential consequences. Dalia's father said, Don't worry, Theo, I promise you that Tobias will achieve great things in the future. But let's settle this matter quickly with Dalia's marriage, as I don't know how much longer I have left. I think my end is near. The scene shifts to Theo, Tobias's father sitting with Delia and her parents, discussing the engagement. They want to submit the document to the Trade Guild to officially consider them engaged. Dahlia and Tobias agree, as they get along well and will make a great team. The scene then shifts to Dahlia talking with her friend, telling her about what happened the previous night and that she got engaged to Tobias. He is very respectable and comes from a commercial family, not from craftsmen. But I also know that he works hard to become more skilled and that matters to me. God does not waste the reward of those who do good work. In the evening, Dahlia returns home. A scene shifts to Dahlia reminiscing about her father, telling her, I am happiest when creating magical devices that bring smiles to people's faces. But what kind of magical devices do you want to make? Since at that moment, an idea comes to her mind, and she starts jotting it down. Her fiancé, Tobias, calls her because the teacher wants to see her. She tells him, I was just writing down the idea I mentioned to you before. I'll go as soon as I finish these notes. Tobias comments, Your hair color is a bit flashy. I think it would be better if you wore light makeup since you'll be joining Orlando Trading Company. We can't afford to tarnish the Rossetti name. Dahlia replies, You're right, dear. Is there anything else you notice? He tells her that the frames of her glasses are not the best and suggests choosing something simpler. Dahlia agrees, Yes, this frame is indeed too flashy, and she is very pleased with his advice. The scene then shifts to Dahlia and Tobias having a meal and drinks together. Dahlia mentions, everyone at Orlando Trading Company treats me kindly, which makes me feel comfortable. Tobias responds, my father and older brother always talk about how great your innovations are. Dahlia is delighted by this compliment. Their conversation is interrupted by a man from the trading company who looks very exhausted. He informs them, the president has collapsed, and I am on my way to get a doctor. They are shocked by this news and rush to the company's headquarters. But they find everyone waiting anxiously for news about the president's condition. Someone comments, this isn't the conversation we should be having right after losing the president, but he was the only one with a complete understanding of the company's operations. We don't know how to handle the most urgent matters. Dahlia steps forward and says, I'll help. Tobias, let's gather everyone as quickly as possible and get an understanding of the situation. The scene then shifts to Delia with her father, who is surprised that she came home so late. He remarks, It seems the situation at the company has improved. She replies, Your experience played a part in that. Thank you so much. He responds, I didn't do anything at all. Dahlia notices that something is bothering her father and asks about it, but he brushes it off, saying, It's nothing. Don't worry about it. Her father then mentions, The look on your face when you said you wanted to make a raincoat is still etched in my mind. Dahlia says, I remember that magical devices should be made to bring smiles to people's faces, and that's when the idea came to me. They then enjoy some drinks together. The next morning, her father stands by the window, noticing that the weather is wonderful and that the cold harvesting season is approaching. His assistant tells him, Miss Dahlia loves you very much. He then recalls his happy memories with her. Suddenly, he collapses, saying, Dahlia, what is the next magical device you want to create? They quickly summon Miss Dahlia and inform her that her father has collapsed at the trade guild. She rushes to check on him, recalling her memories with him, but in the end he passes away. Dahlia cries a lot over her father's passing. They then proceed to bury him in the cemetery, everyone deeply saddened. After everyone leaves, Dahlia remains alone at her father's grave, the man she loved so much. And that's where our episode ends. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to the channel and activate the notification bell to receive all new updates. 
Our episode begins with Dahlia leaving the house and going to Tobias, apologizing for her lateness as she didn't know he was waiting for her. He asks her about the marriage papers, and she tells him she hasn't signed them yet, just as Dahlia starts to sign. Tobias tells her to stop and apologizes, informing her that he wants to break off their engagement because he has found his true love. Amelia Tallini, the receptionist at Orlando Trading Company. Dahlia understands and agrees to break off the engagement, then leaves. The scene shifts to Dahlia with Arma and Marcella, who are angry with Dahlia because Tobias is living in Dahlia's house with his new fiancé, whom he cheated on her with. They describe him as despicable since they have been engaged for over two years, and this is his response. Dahlia thanks them for being upset on her behalf, and Arma expresses relief that she didn't marry such a man. Thus, they suggest eating and enjoying time together, and Dahlia tells them she will go to the trade union to officially break off the engagement and move her things out of the new house. Marcella offers to handle it for her and asks for her house key to move the furniture. Dahlia thanks them very much, then leaves to visit Lucia. She tells Lucia that she broke off her engagement and apologizes for dropping by without an appointment but wanted her to be among the first to know. Lucia asks if she is okay, and Dahlia assures her she is fine. Lucia says she expected this because Dahlia never really loved him, as she never spoke fondly of him, and their conversations were always about magical devices or monster materials. She advises Dahlia to find someone better in the future, but Dahlia says her priority now is her work. Lucia asks if she is mixing fabric for some enchanted raincoats, and Dahlia confirms, saying she has other plans too. Then she tells Lucia she has to go as she has a meeting at the trade union. Dahlia leaves and goes to the trade union, where we see Dahlia and Tobias completing the procedures to break off the engagement. The union manager informs them that they will begin canceling the contract and settle any joint accounts according to the terms of their engagement agreement. Gabriella Guider, the vice president of the union, is present as a witness. Ivano Paduar is the contract manager. Dominic is the public notary overseeing the proceedings. He informs them that Dahlia and Tobias's joint accounts have been closed and settled. Ivano then states that Tobias must pay 12 gold pieces as compensation to Miss Dahlia, starting the house registered in both their names, which was built during their engagement. If Tobias wants to own it, he must pay Dahlia 50 gold pieces. Tobias agrees and pays 28 gold pieces, explaining that this is all he has and asking Dahlia for more time to pay the remainder. Dominic informs them that changing the name on the property deeds before the full amount is paid can cause issues. He then asks Dahlia what she wants to do. Dahlia decides to change the name after the full payment is made. Tobias becomes angry, feeling embarrassed because he had told Amelia that he could live with her in the house immediately. Dominic reassures Tobias that the trade union will lend him the money until he can repay it. Gabriella advises Tobias that if he plans to live with his new partner in the house, he should manage his affairs carefully to avoid ending up in an embarrassing situation. Tobias thanks them for their advice, and they proceed to sign the contract to cancel the engagement. Afterward, we see Dalia handing Mr. Ivano the contract papers. Mr. Ivano, not wanting to be rude, asks her if Mr. Tobias had always been this way. Dahlia replies that she had never seen him act like this before. Mr. Dominic and his Gabriella approach, and Dalia thanks them, saying she couldn't have succeeded without their help. Ms. Gabriella offers to assist Dahlia with the move, saying she will arrange someone for her and will already submit a request at the transport union for that. Suddenly, the door opens, revealing some young people who had been eavesdropping to find out what was happening inside the meeting room. They quickly leave, and Ivano comments that the walls in this meeting room are very thin. Dahlia says, true, I will soon become the subject of gossip. The vice president of the union tells her, let me tell you one thing, congratulations on breaking off your engagement. It's beneficial for you. Elsewhere, we see those young people helping Dahlia move her belongings and devices while Dahlia is present. Marcella says that was the last box. Is there anything else you want us to move from here, Dahlia? She tells him that there is a bed she bought and wants to move it too. Suddenly, she opens the door to the room with the bed and is shocked to find something. Her friend Marcella asks if something is wrong, and she tells him, don't worry, it's nothing. Marcella takes a look and is surprised to find two people sleeping on the bed. He says to Dahlia, don't worry, I'll make that fool buy this bed from you. At that moment, the person wakes up, calls Dahlia and Marcella over, and asks them to take a look at something. They go to the wardrobe and open it to find clothes hanging inside. Marcella says... These aren't his clothes. You said before that you left the wardrobe and the dresser empty. 
Marcella gets angry because those two have made a mess and used the place as they pleased. Marcella tells her that this will be extra work, but it would be better to have a notary present to verify everything she's taking for caution. They can provide a written receipt for everything they've moved so far. They agree on this and request Mr. Dominic, the notary, to come immediately. Sting, after examining all of Delia's belongings and preparing a notarized list, she will return the house key to the trade union and move her things to the tower. Dahlia fears this will take a long time and wonders if she will be able to finish moving all her things today. Later, Mr. Dominic, the notary, arrives to document everything Dahlia has taken from the house. Afterward, she leaves the house for good, gets into the carriage, and looks back at the house. She reminisces about the memories and the past she spent in that house, which she was supposed to get married in. In the evening, Dahlia gives Mr. Dominic the house key and apologizes for asking him to handle this matter. He tells her not to worry about anything and to let him handle whatever she can't manage. She thanks him profusely, and he responds, Your father left us before I could repay my debts of gratitude to him. If you need any help, you can talk to me anytime, dear Dahlia. Don't try to take on everything by yourself. I hope your future is filled with happiness and good luck. She thanks him again. The scene then shifts to Marcella, who presents her with what was moved from the house and asks for her signature. She is very happy and says, You helped me a lot today in many ways. He invites her to have dinner with them, but she thanks him and says she has some preserved food and wants to finish unpacking her things today. He then hands her a box and says, Ima asked me to give this to you if you refused my invitation. It's food that you love. She thanks him profusely and says, Thank you both. She is an excellent wife. Marcella then bids her farewell and Dahlia tells him, Once things settle down, bring your wife Arma and come have something with me. Marcella leaves and Dahlia goes inside to organize her new place. The work is very tiring and by evening she finishes cleaning and arranging everything. Exhausted, she remembers her ex-fiancé Tobias who betrayed her. She recalls him saying, if it means I can protect you in the Rossetti name, I will marry you. She also remembers that her father had arranged the engagement to this man. She reflects, now that I've lost my father and his support, if Tobias has found a woman he loves, maybe it was bound to happen. The surprising thing is that I can't cry about this. In my previous life, my last memory was the feel of the desk as I bowed my head and died in the same way. That's why I strive in this life to prevent that from happening again. I tried to be a good wife and worked hard to ensure I wouldn't end up alone, and this is the result. Suddenly, she notices something shining on the floor like a jewel. She picks it up and says, I won't bow my head anymore. She opens the window, looks out at the world, and says, I will speak of what I love and what I hate, starting now. Fortunately, I love my job as a magic artisan. I don't want to force myself to be with anyone. I will live this second life in the way I want to live it in the best way possible. Then she remembers her father when they used to drink hibiscus together. It's as if her father were alive now. She is very sure he would stand by her, be angry on her behalf, and help her laugh. To her, her father was everything in that life. She then holds that gift and remembers Lucia, the girl with green hair, and says, That's right. I have people to stand by me and also other girls and some acquaintances. They are truly wonderful. The scene then shifts to when she was at the hairdresser getting her hair cut, and she talks to her about that necklace. It seems it is related to the Viscount, as she recognized it from the emblem on it. There is no other way to interpret it. Women who steal men are very cunning. You have every right to be angry, Dahlia. Dahlia replies, I'd rather forget about it as soon as possible. It no longer concerns me that much. It was an engagement and a failed experience, but that's life. When you pick a watermelon, you don't know if it's red or green inside until you open it. The hairdresser tells her, don't worry, Dahlia. You will find much better people very soon. After that, the hairdresser finishes her work while Dahlia watches herself and finds that she looks very different from before. She is really very beautiful. Dahlia thanks her a lot for the beautiful color and the wonderful work. The hairdresser then asks her, do you have more time? Would you like to have coffee before you leave? They then drink coffee and eat cake together, chatting about their problems. In the evening, Dahlia leaves and the hairdresser tells her she can visit anytime. Dahlia replies, okay, but I have many things I want to do first, and after that I will come to you. Although I was thinking of going to the forest tomorrow to gather materials for a change, her friend, the hairdresser says, okay, Dahlia, you need to go out every day so you don't get bored from thinking too much. But will you go to the forest alone? It's better to be very careful. She replied, no need to worry, I will return before dark. I also thought about safety measures before going. 
She then thanked her for the extra concern, bid her farewell, and left, appearing very delighted. In the morning, Dahlia dressed in men's clothing and wore a hat, turning on a voice-changing device to sound like a man. She got into the car, prepared her equipment, and set off for the forest. She was now fully ready. As she drove, she admired the trees, forests, and mountains, exclaiming, How beautiful this area is! It seems very peaceful. I love the beauty of nature. In those moments, things took an unexpected turn. Suddenly, her horse stopped, indicating something strange. Dahlia caught her breath, waiting to see what would emerge from the place. Just then, a boy appeared, seemingly injured, and asked her for water. She quickly gave him some water, and he said, Thank you. I feel like I've come back to life, but he fainted again, with blood covering his body and a wound on his left shoulder. Dahlia hurriedly prepared some medicine, gave it to him, and his wound healed like magic, restored her. He apologized to her, saying, I will make sure to repay you as soon as I return to the royal capital. She replied, No worries, my friend. Don't trouble yourself with such matters. I am just doing a good deed. He then stood up and introduced himself as a member of the Monster Suppression Knights named Alfred, the youngest son of a low-ranking noble. Please, just call me Wolf. Will Delia be charmed by this young man, and will he change her life? We will find out in the upcoming episodes. Stay tuned and subscribe to the channel to keep up with all the latest developments. Our episode begins with a person introducing himself as a member of the Monster Suppression Knights. His name is Wilfred, the youngest son of a low-ranking noble, and he asks her to call him Wilf. Dahlia introduces herself as an ordinary citizen. Wilf then requests her to accompany him to the capital, to which Dahlia agrees immediately. Dahlia notices that Wilf's eyes seem to be hurting, and he explains that some monster blood got into his eye, causing him pain. He mentions he needs to wash it out as soon as possible. Dahlia tells him there's a river nearby and apologizes for only having the driver's seat available, meaning he has to sit next to her. Wilf worries about dirtying the seat with his clothes, but Dahlia reassures him that the seat is covered with water-resistant fabric. They get into the carriage and start moving. Wilf asks her if the fabric is really that useful, and Dahlia explains that they used to have to wax their tents, but now that they have waterproof fabric, life has become much easier. She adds that raincoats made from this fabric are great because they're lightweight. Dahlia comments that they would be even better if they had more ventilation openings. Wilf responds that durability is a key factor, making it difficult to implement such features easily. Dahlia thinks for a moment and suggests that new materials could solve this problem. Wilf apologizes for talking too much, and they soon arrive at the river. Wilf washes his face thoroughly with water, and Dahlia hands him a towel to dry his face. She is captivated by the beauty of his eyes. Wilf mentions he will wash the monster blood off his body, and Dahlia goes to cook some food. She gives him a coat to wear while his clothes dry, explaining that it belonged to her father. Wilf apologizes for causing her so much trouble. Once Dahlia finishes preparing the meal, Wilf wears the coat and they sit down to eat. Wilf comments that it's been a long time since he's had such delicious food. Dahlia then asks him how his eye feels. He tells her that the pain has subsided, but his vision hasn't fully recovered yet. Dahlia advises him to see a doctor. Then, she notices the red armor he was wearing and asks, Wilf, are you one of the Crimson Shields? He explains that, being quick-witted, this armor is suitable for attracting the attention of monsters. The only ones who wear red armor in the monster suppression forces are those who lead the first attack against the monsters. They attract a lot of attention and are used as a diversion. All the monster suppression forces do dangerous work, which puts them at risk of death. As they talk, Dahlia remembers her father, Wilf notices and asks if she's forgotten that the coat he's wearing is all he has on now. He jokes that taking it off in front of a young lady in the town might get him in trouble with the guards for acting inappropriately. Dahlia is surprised and tells him not to say such things. Wilf quickly apologizes and explains that he had to say something silly because he noticed she seemed a bit sad. Then he asks her if she likes magical devices. Dahlia replies that she loves them. It's her source of income. Wilf asks if there are any magical swords available to ordinary citizens. She says she doesn't think such things exist. Only wizards and alchemists can infuse swords with magic. However, she thinks that magical craftsmen do make enchanted knives. Wilf asks what kind of magic is used on the knives. Dahlia tells him that the most common is anti-rust magic, but there's also a popular enchantment for permanent sharpness. He remarks that such enchantments would be very useful on a sword adding that most swords in his unit are enchanted with durability magic, but his sword still broke. 
Finally, Wilf asks Dahlia if she has ever seen a magical sword before. He mentions that he once saw a magical flame sword at the trade guild, but it was sheathed since no one could draw it. He expresses a desire to see a magical flame sword, saying the most impressive one he's seen is the one carried by the leader of the monster suppression forces. It is called Ash Hand, and it burns anything it pierces to ashes immediately. No one else can wield it. Otherwise, anyone other than the owner will burn if it is unsheathed. Dahlia thinks to herself, I bet he knows that from experience. Then he tells her that there are also two famous magical swords in the castle without masters. Since there is no one worthy of them, no one can wield them. When I first joined the knights, I tried to draw them but failed. Dahlia asks, is it about magical compatibility or are there other special requirements? Wolf tells her that for the two swords in the castle, it's said to be a matter of nobility of spirit or a strong sense of duty. I wish I had the social standing required to show them to you, Dahlia. No, nope, she says. Just talking about them was fun, and I appreciate that. It will be the foundation for future works, but we should get going now. We still have a long way to go to the royal capital. They ride in the carriage and start the journey. Dahlia suggests that since the trip will take some time, Wolf should sleep until they arrive they drink sodas, which Wolf enjoys a lot. On the way, it starts to rain heavily. They reach the capital, and Wolf gets out of the carriage, Dahlia tells him. You can keep the coat. I don't want you to catch a cold. It's made of sand lizard skin, so it's good against the rain. Wolf thanks her profusely and says he will borrow it for now and reminds her that she saved his life today. He wouldn't be alive without her. He then asks where she lives so he can visit and pay her back for everything. Dahlia tells him not to worry about it since she's already reaped the benefits of his work in suppressing monsters. Consider it a citizen support. If you see me around town, just say hi. I'll definitely accept your offer then. They bid each other farewell with smiles on their faces. Then Dahlia heads home, takes off her hat, and says, What a busy day. But I'm very happy that I could help this person. The capital is so big that we may never meet again. I hope Mr. Wolf's eye heals well. The scene then transitions to Dahlia with Mr. Ivano and the contract for the small magic device, which was in Tobias's name. She says, This lady said that Mr. Tobias claimed you agreed to it, so I assumed you put it in his name. Then the vice president of the guild enters and says to Dahlia, I am now representing the trade guild in the absence of its leader, and greets her, she continues. I apologize to you sincerely. Dahlia asks her to please raise her head and not bow to her. The trade guild president says, if you wish, we can file a lawsuit against Tobias for contract fraud. Dahlia responds, if he intends to cancel the contract on his own, would it be possible to avoid penalties for Mr. Orlando and the craftsman? The guild president tells her, we won't argue with you if that's your decision. Dahlia tells them, I will go discuss the matter with Mr. Orlando. Mr. Ivano, the contract manager, says, honestly, no one would blame her if she punched him, but this is how colleagues in the trade usually act. The trade guild president adds, not like this, but the person you're trying to protect is Carlo. If his senior apprentice causes trouble, it will damage his reputation and make Carlo sad. I think that's what you're considering without even realizing it. Delia then arrives at her destination, looks at the house, and goes up to Tobias. Tobias apologizes to her and says, I forgot to explain that it was just a misunderstanding. She asks him, what do you mean? My magic device is registered under your name. Dahlia realized at that moment that her magical device was registered under Tobias's name, and it seemed that the guild staff believed he had her permission to do so. Tobias explained to her that the reason was that they were planning to start a new partnership after getting married, so he thought all their inventions should be under one name. Dahlia understood that he meant he intended to do the same with all her magical devices since they were going to produce a company together, and all the registrations would be either in his name or both of their names, Dahlia told him that when someone invents a device that will be used by people, they must engrave their name on it and take responsibility for it until the end, as her father had taught her. Tobias tried to speak, but Dahlia interrupted him, saying that it would have been better if he had registered it in both of their names, but he had registered it in his name only. If there were any problems or incidents, she wouldn't have been informed. Tobias tried to justify his actions by saying he would have informed her in due time. But Delia refused to talk to him and asked him to cancel the contract for the small magical stove before the end of the day and that she would register it under her own name. Tobias felt saddened and pleaded with Dahlia to leave the registration as it was, offering to buy the rights to the small magical stove from her. 
He told her she could set any price she wanted, and his company would pay whatever amount she asked for. However, Dahlia refused, stating that any contracts the guild objected to could be canceled. She also mentioned that she had been told she could sue him if she wished. Tobias didn't pay much attention to this, knowing she wouldn't do it. But Dahlia, speaking as a magical artisan, told him she found the fact that he changed the registration even more pathetic, despite considering him her father's senior student. Tobias understood that she had no intention of selling him the rights to the small magical stove, even if the Orlando Trading Company stopped doing business with her. As Dahlia got up to leave, she ordered him to submit the appropriate paperwork to the guild before the end of the day. At that moment, Amelia came to Tobias and apologized. Tobias told her that she hadn't done anything wrong and that it was all his fault, acknowledging that he was just a fellow student to her. Just afterward, we transition to the guild where we see Dahlia with an adventurer. She explains to him what happened and mentions that as soon as Mr. Orlando cancels the contract, she wants to register the device herself. She also mentions that the Orlando Trading Company will no longer be doing business with her, so she hopes the adventurer can introduce her to a new partner. The adventurer asks if Mr. Tobias was the one who did this, to which Delia responds that he did indeed do it, as the order came directly from Mr. Orlando. The adventurer then asks to go and discuss the matter with the deputy leader. Just at this moment, Marcella arrives and asks Delia if she is there for a meeting. She replies that she is looking for a new company to be her partner, as it seems she won't be able to work with the Orlando Trading Company anymore. Marcella is delighted to hear that she wants to establish her own company, Rosetti, and tells her that if she does, she can buy and sell as she pleases. However, Dahlia interrupts him, saying she hasn't thought about her own company yet, and regardless of the security deposit, she won't find four guarantees at all. Dahlia spoke up, asking, are you all sure about this? It's all so sudden, and I haven't prepared anything. I just started as a magical artisan, so there might not be much profit. The man replied, the moment you invented the waterproof fabric, you became more than qualified, Marcella added. I want you to think about this. All the materials you mentioned wanting to try, like scales from wind or fire dragons and even sea serpent skins. I heard they killed a griffin in the neighboring countries. If you establish Rossetti Company, you might be able to acquire materials from them. Then Miss Gabriella spoke to Dahlia. We'll go to the meeting room now to prepare for the company's contract. They headed there together, and Gabriella suggested, We can discuss how you can act more like a company president, Dahlia responded. I may be the president, but I'm the only one in the company. Gabriella advised, To avoid being underestimated based on your appearance, I think it's best to dress well. They entered a clothing store where Gabriella explained, Clothing like this serves as an introductory message when meeting people. It's essential to leave a good first impression. You should change your style to something that suits you more, Afterward, they went to another place to take care of Dahlia's appearance and skin. Gabriella remarked, You have beautiful skin, so improving your eyebrows, adding eyeliner, lipstick, and some blush will be enough. Since Dahlia had been using a lot of monster materials in her work recently, they successfully helped her enhance her appearance and clothing. Later, Gabriella told her, I'll start calling you Dahlia, and you should call me Gabriella too, without any titles. As presidents, we address our colleagues informally, she then suggested. I want you to get your eyes checked at the temple and stop wearing glasses as they might be a hindrance to you. Dahlia thanked her and apologized for the trouble she caused that day. Gabriella reassured her, don't worry, I'm just repaying my debt to Carlo. Dahlia asked, what do you owe my father? Gabriella explained, he's the one who introduced me to my husband, so both of us owe him a lot. Your father once told me, Gabriella continued, if Dahlia ever faced problems as a magical artisan or as a woman, give her advice. And if she didn't face any problems, keep it a secret until the end because he always listened to others' issues with patience and advised them. Everyone relied on him, Dahlia replied. I didn't know any of this. I thought he was just wandering around and getting drunk. I didn't know he had any hobbies. I thought he liked drinking, Gabriella chuckled. Yes, he liked drinking, but his favorite hobby was making others indebted to him and then asking them to keep it a secret. Dahlia felt joy knowing more about her father's actions. The scene then shifts to Wilfred, who says, I've noted everything in my report. The manager replied, you took down a wyvern, so you've earned the title of Dragon Slayer. Since you dealt the final blow, there won't be any issues. Wilfred responded, the unit managed to wound it first. It was weakened when I finished it off. The manager insisted, I believe it's time for you to bear that title. I'll write a recommendation letter for the Royal Guard, Wilfred said. I hope you don't. 
The next time I catch a wyvern, I'd prefer not to be linked to the event. The manager, somewhat annoyed, told him, take a break until your eyes are fully healed. Wilfred then requested, could you send a letter of introduction to the trading guild? I want to thank the person who saved me with that potion. He's benefiting from our monster hunting, so we don't need to thank him. The manager replied, wait, I'll write the letter of introduction right away. Wilfred took the letter and left. Thus, today's episode of this anime ends. Stay tuned for the upcoming episodes and don't forget to subscribe and activate the notification bell to get the latest updates. Our episode begins with Dahlia taking off her glasses and saying, I don't know if the church can restore sight. I should have done this earlier, but it's expensive. Then she looks up and sees a boy approaching her and asking, Are you a member of Mr. Daly's family? Dahlia asks him. How did you know that? He tells her that her way of averting her eyes from him is very strange, in addition to the color of her eyes and her scent. It was the same scent he smelled in the carriage. He then asks if he can sit with her to talk for a bit, and Dahlia agrees. He tells her that he was on his way to the trade guild looking for her and intended to ask if they knew someone matching her description. He wanted to repay her for the potion and return the cult. He invites her to visit his house sometime and Dahlia agrees. They order a cold drink and he continues talking, telling Dahlia that when he saw her in the forest, he didn't realize she was so beautiful. Dahlia thanks him very much for the kind words. He asks her if she is from a noble family and Dahlia tells him that her father was an honorable baron. She also tells him that it is tiring to continue complimenting women he doesn't know. He then asks her why she was disguised as a man when he saw her. She tells him that it is not safe for a woman to be alone in the forest, so she was forced to do so. Then the drinks arrive, and they drink and start eating. During that time, Dahlia asks him about his eyes, and he tells her they are somewhat okay, but he cannot see clearly with them. When Dahlia starts eating, he tells her that the meat is from the Scarlet Nymphs, which is very common lately. Dahlia tastes it and tells him they need more drinks as well, and they laugh. He then asks her if her father scolded her because of the coat he took from her. She tells him that her father passed away some time ago. He apologizes to her and tells her he will wash it and return it to her as soon as possible. Dahlia tells him that the lining is made of wyvern material. She added it to enhance the coat for her father when he wore it because it used to get stuck with a lot of things. Will asks her, Do you work in the clothing field or a field related to raw materials? Dahlia tells him, my name is Delia Rossetti, and I have recently started my career as a magical artisan. I am the one who invented the waterproof fabric, and now I am thinking about creating a lighter one that allows for more ventilation. As their drinks finish, he tells her he will go to order more, and then he leaves. Suddenly, Amelia arrives, followed by Dahlia's ex-fiancé, who tells Amelia there is no need to inform Dahlia of anything. Dahlia insists that she must tell Delia because their engagement was broken off because of her. While they are talking, we see Will approaching Dahlia and telling her that since her engagement has been broken off, he invites her to his house again and would be very grateful if she accepted. Amelia asks Dahlia who he is and Will introduces himself, saying, I am Wilfred Scalverado of the Royal Knights. He then looks at Dahlia again and asks her to accompany him, and they leave. As they walk together, Dahlia thanks Will for getting her out of that awkward situation. Will apologizes for having to handle it that way. She tells him she was very surprised that he spoke so smoothly. He tells her he wasn't lying. She had refused his invitation at the gate, and when she left her carriage, he told himself he wanted to talk to her again. She tells him she didn't hear him because of the rain and was very sad because she was lying to him at that time. She then tells him that she was previously engaged to that boy, but her father arranged it without her consent. Before he could marry her, he told her he had found the love of his life, and broke off their engagement, Will tells her he doesn't understand the phrase true love at all, and that he is frustrated because her ex-fiancé interrupted their meal and conversation. He then suggests they go somewhere else, and Dahlia agrees since she wasn't fully satisfied yet. They enter a restaurant, and Will places a triangular device on the table, telling her it's an anti-eavesdropping device, so no one can listen to their conversation. Dahlia expresses her happiness about this, but wonders why the son of an earl cannot speak freely. Will explains that he doesn't intend to end his family's legacy, but he feels he hasn't contributed anything useful to his family's history. Being the youngest, he was left alone without anyone guarding or monitoring him, and he isn't very comfortable with formalities. Dahlia tells him she doesn't know any noble etiquette, so she asks him for a suitable and easy way for him to speak. Then she asks him how the anti-eavesdropping device was made. Steve Wilfred told her that he had heard that certain sounds could be covered by other sounds, thereby canceling each other out. He asked if she made things like that too. 
She replied that she only invented devices for everyday life and that such devices were the domain of wizards. Wilfred then began to stare at her, and she asked him what was wrong. He told her it was nothing, but she looked extremely happy while gazing at the magical device. Her face turned red and she told him that his behavior had changed drastically and had surprised her. He told her that he admired her a lot and loved looking into her beautiful eyes, thanking God for finding her. He smiled slightly and told her that he had wanted to talk to her and meet her very much. His tool day ate fresh food together and talked. He asked her if mixing magic with a device resulted in only one type or more than one type. Dahlia replied that usually it was one type for each device and that applying more than one type fell under the domain of wizards and alchemists. However, when more than one device was used, she believed they layered the magic to ensure it did not interfere with each other. Wilfred said that he had thought about casting cleaning and strengthening spells together on a sword, as well as something like weight reduction. Dahlia paused for a moment and then asked if it was possible to change the sword's guard and sheath. He said yes because they sometimes broke. From this, Dahlia concluded that the parts could be treated as separate items, meaning they could be separated. She suggested strengthening the blade, adding a cleaning property to the guard with water or wind magic, and applying weight reduction magic to the sheath before reassembling them. Wilfred jumped up from his seat, very happy, and told her that it was amazing and would make a magical sword, which would greatly benefit his unit. He said he loved magical swords and that such weapons, imbued with magic, carried dreams with them, and just thinking about them was very enjoyable. Dahlia agreed, saying she also loved magical devices and enjoyed just thinking about them or watching them on YouTube. He asked if she minded if he called her just Dahlia, and if she could call him just Wolf. She agreed, but said it would be hard for her to call him Wolf. He told her that she would get used to it and that he would be very happy when she did. But let's focus on the main thing. If I bring you a sword, can you try the magic application method we talked about earlier? She agreed, but suggested starting with a cheap short sword. As for your name, just Wolf without any additions when we're alone. Wolf was very happy and smiled, glad to have met Dahlia, the skilled, crafty, and beautiful girl. The scene then shifted to the evening when Wolf accompanied her home to protect her from bandits. She pointed to the place where she lived, known as the Green Tower. She explained that there had been a wall of the royal palace nearby, and when it was demolished, her grandfather was allowed to take the stones to build the house. He gave her a large sum of money, and when she looked at it, she said it was too much. He insisted she accept it, saying he would be very upset if she refused. She took it, and he asked if he could return the day after tomorrow to bring back her coat, and then they could go to the Magical Devices store in the Northern District together. Wilfred told her that the store was in the Noble District and that he would come before noon. She didn't need to worry about having an invitation since he would be with her, ensuring they could enter. She agreed and said she would see him tomorrow. They said goodbye, and she left. The next day, Dahlia woke up from a strange dream. A lady spoke to her, saying that having such a dream might mean something concerning Carlo, and she was sure it was annoying. Dahlia replied that maybe it was because she drank with Wilfred the previous night. The lady mentioned that Wilfred was indeed an attention grabber, famous even among the nobility, and asked if Dahlia was going somewhere with Lord Scalverado. Dahlia said he was taking her to the store in the noble district, where they trade in magical devices for the nobility. The lady told her to enjoy her time on the trip. After that, we see Wilfred waiting for Dahlia in front of the palace. She comes down quickly, saying, If my memory serves me right, I think we agreed to meet before noon. He replied, Yes, I came early because the distance is very long, but it seems I was quick in my journey. Dahlia responded, saying, I will go to get ready. Wait for me a bit. He apologized for coming early and handed her the coat he had taken. Dahlia told him she was happy it had been of help to him. They then set off on their way and reached the place where many girls noticed and admired him. They entered the store and Dahlia was astonished by it. Wilfred told her that the owner of the store was a magical craftsman and a baron named Oswald. Dahlia mentioned that he had invented the cold air delivery device, which had been around since she was a child, and that he had been a magical craftsman for a long time. Wilfred told her that they should follow the etiquette of the nobles while they were in the store and that he appreciated her company. Oswald spoke to Wilfred, and Wilfred introduced Dahlia to him, saying she was a magical craftsman to whom he owed a lot. Dahlia told Oswald that she was still at the beginning of her journey and would appreciate any information he could share. Oswald interrupted her, saying, You are Mr. Carlo's daughter. He was a friend from high school. I met him at Baron meetings. I hope I haven't discouraged you. Wilfred noticed something and said, That's a new model of the anti-cleaning device designed as cufflinks and it can also match the color of your clothes. Delia says as she looks at it through her lens. 
It applies a triple combination of an antitoxin, an anti-petrification, and an anti-confusion agent. She adds, Mr. Oswald informs her, among many people like knights and adventurers who seek lighter purposes, we ask an alchemist to create it for us. Then Dahlia looks and sees this lamp and says, this is a crystal fairy lamp. Mr. Oswald tells her that it uses a magic crystal array, perhaps to help the fairies hide themselves, and has a perception-blocking effect. Dahlia laughs and tells him, My father once enchanted my room's window with fairy crystal magic, and three gold coins disappeared in one day. It made me realize how difficult it was even for my father, who had made a crystal fairy lamp before. Mr. Oswald is surprised to find himself so engrossed in his conversation with Mrs. Delia that he is late for his appointment. Dahlia apologizes to him. At that moment, Lord Wolf arrives and asks him if he would like to see the supporting accessories he requested. Lord Wolf agrees with pleasure. He then shows them two anklets that are anti-toxic, prevent anemia, and also have anti-petrification and anti-confusion magic. He informs him that the size can be adjusted in the next room if desired. Lord Wolf tells Dahlia that he will be back soon. Mr. Oswald then presents Mrs. Dahlia with this golden card and asks her to use it from now on. She can come here whenever she wants using this card. She asks why he is giving it to her. He tells her, I owe a lot to Mr. Carlo. He once told me that if his daughter ever came to my shop, he hoped I would show her my magical devices. But if that never happened, I should keep it a secret until my death. I am very pleased to have met you, Mrs. Delia, when my time comes and I meet your father. I will tell him that I have repaid the debt. Dahlia wonders about this debt, and he tells her when I was young, my wife ran away with a worker in this shop taking our money with her. While I was debating whether to close the shop or take a big loan, Mr. Carlo came to me and invited me for tea at a small booth. We spent a wonderful time together and I told him everything. I told him about my wife leaving and taking our money with her. Mr. Carlo gave me advice and said, let me show you the best thing to do in times like find a new woman. He boasted about having a beautiful young lady himself. After we had tea, he invited me to the green tower. There I met a little girl and he wasn't wrong when he said you were a beautiful little girl. That made me laugh a lot. So he met when you were very young. He said his daughter gets heat rashes due to the lack of airflow that made the tower hot. Since he invited me, I had to think of a magical device to prevent that. The device I invented was the cold wind delivery device. Best of all, I was able to rebuild my shop. Unfortunately, I could only meet Mr. Carlo at baronial meetings, and if I had known this would happen, I would have invited him myself. And I repeat, I was the only one who felt that way. Not him, Dahlia tells him, because in the summer my father was very happy with the cold wind delivery device. At this point, Mr. Oswald begins to cry over the loss of Mr. Carlo and thanks his daughter profusely. Dahlia also thanks him because she was very happy to hear such stories about her father. Then he asks her to visit his shop again someday. They browse together and then Dahlia leaves the shop with her friend Wolf. Dahlia looks at the golden card she received from the shop owner and notices her father's handwriting on it. He always left his coat where he took it off and never noticed even when his shoes shone. She can sit sidewalks and as she told him many times to sleep in his bed, it's not fair to show me your good side after you died. And Dahlia begins to cry heavily. Wolf calms her down and puts a hood over her head. And with that, our episode ends today. Stay tuned for more episodes of this very exciting anime, but please subscribe to the channel and activate the notification bell to receive all the new updates. Our episode begins with Dahlia talking to Wilfred, apologizing for causing him so much trouble. He reassures her, saying, Don't worry about it. I'm used to this sort of thing. She never imagined she would hear stories about her father in a place like that store, even though it had been nearly a year since his death. Then, Wilfred makes a request. He wants to accompany her to that store in the future. Dahlia asks him, Why, dear? Did I do something inappropriate? But it turns out that's not the case. It seems she and Oswald have gotten along quite well. She says to him, I don't understand what you're trying to say. What exactly do you mean? That's when Wilfred gets to the point, explaining that Oswald is a very wealthy man, and, being a nobleman, he has no issue with taking multiple wives. In fact, he already has two wives around the same age as Dahlia, so he wouldn't mind marrying a third. The law allows him four wives, and I fear he might charm you into marrying him as well. Dahlia is shocked and says, That's impossible. The scene then shifts to them being on the street, 
heading to get lunch from a stall at the beginning of the street. Wilfred orders food, and they sit together. He pulls out a ring and wants her to wear it. He explains, if someone ever puts something harmful in your food, this ring will instantly absorb the poison. As for him, his body has become highly resistant to poisons, and he also wears an anklet just in case. If something happens, the anklet will absorb the poison. They eat together, enjoying a very delicious and aromatic meal. Dahlia then gets up to fetch more red drink while Wilfred waits. He waits for quite some time before deciding to see what's going on. When he reaches her, he finds someone trying to take her to his house. She tells him, Let go of me, you brute! I don't want to go with you. Let go of my hand, you fool, or you'll regret this. He dares her to try something, saying it would be amusing to see her attempt anything. You're such a delicate girl, he adds. That's when she uses the ring she has and performs magic. She then apologizes to the restaurant owner, but the owner tells her, we should be the ones apologizing. We couldn't stop him. Here, Take these two cups on the house, but you must visit our restaurant again with your beloved, by the tree. Wilfred apologizes profusely for not going instead of her, but she reassures him that she can defend herself. She also wanted to test the freezing bracelet she had, and it turned out to be very powerful. She suggests that it might be useful to add freezing magic to a sword. Wilfred agrees, saying, Yes, that sounds good. I'll buy you a short sword from the weapons store on our way back so you can try it out. She asked to go with him because her father never took her to those kinds of shops. He was very protective of her. When she was attending the academy, she was burned by a slime. And from that time on, her father never left her alone. Wilfred asked, Was that when you were still developing the waterproof fabric? She replied, Yes, I usually used a glass rod to stir it, but I got distracted and stirred it with my hand instead. It was a black slime, which has a numbing toxin, so I didn't feel any pain at all. But my father wrapped me in cloth and took me straight to the emergency room. Thankfully, I recovered well, though it cost us two gold coins. Wilfred said, That means it wasn't an ordinary burn. I believe the burn reached your bones and your father didn't allow you to see it because if you had, you might have been traumatized. Black slimes are known for overpowering knights despite their immunity to almost everything. They're resistant to fire, water, and wind. He then looked at her and said, From now on, don't do anything dangerous like that because I worry about you. In the evening, they returned home, and she said, Here's a meal, I prepared for you as a token of my gratitude for this wonderful day. She had cooked a delicious and hearty meal, which made Wilfred very happy. After they finished eating, Wilfred insisted on washing the dishes himself, saying, Don't worry, we're all here to help each other. Plus, I'm used to this from my time in the army. She then invited him to have some alcohol if he had time, but he responded, Alcohol clouds the mind and is forbidden. Most importantly, if I drink it now, it will just be the two of us in the house with the devil as our third companion, and we might commit forbidden acts. I don't want that. She replied, I let you in because you're a respectable person, so don't tempt me or I might get aroused. He reassured her, saying, Don't worry, my dear. She then brought him hibiscus juice instead of wine. Afterward, he started talking about himself and how his friendships with other women had fallen apart because they cheated on their husbands. A married woman might tell me that she loves me and wants to be with me, but that's a great betrayal. How can a married woman love someone else? When I rejected her, she lied and said I was the one chasing her, falsely accusing me. My friend believed her and punched me hard in the face and our friendship ended. Dahlia asked him how often this had happened to him, and he replied that he was used to it, and similar things had happened several times. But that woman wasn't related to me. Many people have told me that my beautiful eyes are the reason I attract so many women, 
So you say to him, all right, my friend, don't worry. From today on, you will walk among people and no one will despise you anymore. Then you decided to make him magical glasses to change the color of his eyes. Dahlia tells him, I'm going to blend these glasses with the fairy crystal, to which Wilfred replies, A fairy crystal? Like the lamp we saw in the store today? Dahlia explains that fairy crystals have the ability to block perception, and she thinks she might be able to change how others see his eyes. This experiment is very difficult, she adds, so expect a high chance of failure. I'm sorry to say this after bringing you here, but think of it as a trial, please. Wilfred asks, Can I watch you work on it? Dahlia agrees, and she begins the experiment. She places something on the lenses of the glasses and uses a spell. She mentions, If I don't align the fairy crystal properly, the perception blocking will affect the sides of the lenses, and they won't work as glasses. Dahlia recalls her father's advice. You need to talk to the materials as you work with them. Ask them where they want to go and what angle they prefer. If you do that, sometimes you and the magical device or materials will understand each other. Returning to the present, Dahlia becomes deeply engaged with the materials, asking the fairies, What is your wish? The fairies respond, I want to make his eyes less prominent for his own good. The fairies gather around Dahlia and ask, Why do you want to hide his eyes when they are so beautiful? Dahlia explains, I want to protect him from greed and malice. I want you to protect him so he can smile. I don't want him to be harmed. The fairies agree, saying, We will protect him for you as long as you take us to the rainbow. The fairies then begin to interact with Dahlia and the glasses. She is so focused on the experiment that sweat starts to form on her face. Wilfred suggests, maybe it would be better to take a break. But Dahlia quickly hushes him, asking him to be quiet so she can concentrate on finishing the second lens. She works on the other lens just as she did with the first one. And after much effort, she completes both lenses. She hands the glasses to Wilfred, who tries them on and says, I can see everything clearly. Nothing is too shiny. Dahlia asks him to look in the mirror. When he does, he sees that the color of his eyes has changed when wearing the glasses. Dahlia apologizes, saying, Some of my father's traits must have rubbed off on me. Do you think you'll be able to walk around town without a head covering now? Wilfred smiles and replies, Yes, I think I will. Wilfred thanks Dahlia profusely for what she has done for him and tells her, No matter the price you ask, it's worth it. Dahlia, surprised, replies, No, this is just a prototype made from leftover materials. Please lift your head. He then asks her how much it would cost to make new glasses. She explains that the cost of the glasses with the lenses, plus the cost of crafting them, would be about three large silver coins. But considering that the cost of the fairy crystal glass alone is three gold coins, it would be more expensive. Wilfred says, I understand. I'll get the money ready for you soon. Dahlia quickly responds, No, don't worry about it. As I said, this is just a prototype. Would you like to have a second pair of glasses, just to be safe? Wilfred answers, I would be happy to have another pair, but I don't want you to go through all that trouble again. All Dahlia smiles and says, When you have to fight a monster twice, isn't the second time easier? Wilfred agrees with her, and she continues, It's the same with making magical devices. Unlike fighting monsters, if I fail, I'll just lose consciousness. Although I've exhausted most of my magical energy, this was a successful attempt. The next morning, we see Wilfred walking down the street with his new glasses, saying to himself, Finally, I feel like I'm getting used to this part of the capital. He then sits in the same resting spot where he used to sit with Dahlia, finding himself doing it without even thinking. As he sits there, memories of his past flood his mind. He recalls his childhood and says, My mother rushed into battle to protect me and her friends when I was a child. 
She died in the end. After losing her, I grew up in an unstable environment. The way people looked at me started to change, and I dedicated myself to carrying the sword as a means of escaping that. After joining the Monster Suppression Forces, the unit that cares the least about social status, things became a bit easier for me. Even now, with good enough relationships and a decent life, it's both a blessing and a curse. I still carry the same dream. If I had a magical sword, could I have saved my mother in that dream? Even if all I inherited was her appearance and not her exceptional magic? Wilfred continues his thoughts, saying, Dahlia is truly amazing. We've only met three times, but she's already changed my life. Her face is serious, covered in sweat, with her makeup fading. She's the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. This isn't love because she doesn't want that. I want to stay by her side, to share companionship and respect like two close friends. I'll do everything I can to make that happen. Meanwhile, the scene shifts to Orlando speaking with Tobias. Orlando says, You caused quite a mess while I was away, and asks Tobias what he's dissatisfied with in Dahlia. He continues, It's fine if that's your taste in women, but don't count on forming any noble connections. Tobias asks what he means, and Orlando explains, Amelia is the daughter of the younger brother of the former Viscount. The Viscount's family paid her a large sum at the time, and officially, they've severed all ties with her. He then hands Tobias a paper, saying, This is proof of what I'm saying. Tobias takes the paper and responds, I don't care about that. Amelia is still Amelia. Orlando warns him not to underestimate the nobility, adding that if he gets entangled with her family, it could be the end of their partnership. Tobias is shocked and says, You're exaggerating. But Orlando replies, Do you now understand why our father wanted you to marry Dahlia? It was our father's idea to suggest the marriage to Carlo because there's no one else here who can support you as a magical craftsman. Tobias, still puzzled, asks, Then why did the master agree to it? Orlando answers, For personal benefit, a magical craftswoman without a family will always be a target for unsavory people. Our company came up with a way to protect both of you while keeping a low profile. Tobias realizes, So I was just a cover for Dahlia, the magical craftswoman. It didn't have to be me. It could have been anyone else. But then Tobias recalls what Eduardo Carlo once said. Tobias is a dedicated man. He works with integrity, born into a family of merchants. But through hard work, he's becoming a magical craftsman. One day, he might even surpass me. I can't wait to see what kind of magical devices he'll create. Eduardo then explains that he wanted Tobias and Dahlia to be colleagues who would support each other throughout their lives. Tobias, feeling betrayed, asks, Why didn't any of you tell me this? Eduardo responds, If we had told you, you never would have married Dahlia. I take responsibility for that as well. No one asked for his name, and no one treated him with hostility. He finally felt free to walk around without worry. Dahlia is overjoyed by this and says, I can't let you just stand there while we talk. Would you like to have a cup of tea with me? Wilfred, sensing her busy schedule, politely declines, saying, I don't want to interrupt your work. It seems like you're busy right now. He turns to leave, but before he goes, Dahlia asks, Would you like to enchant the short sword the next time you visit? Wilfred smiles and replies, I'm looking forward to that. The scene shifts to Dahlia, who reflects on her work. People sometimes mock me because I'm just a magical craftswoman. I can't use flashy spells like professional mages, nor can I create rare metals or healing potions like alchemists. My development process is based on trial and error. Even if I make good magical devices, there's no guarantee someone will need them. But when my devices do help someone or make them smile, Seeing that moment is so fulfilling that I can't get enough of it. That's why I can't stop being a magical craftswoman. I take pride in my work and will continue to do so for the rest of my life. And with that, the episode ends. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel and hit the notification bell so you won't miss any updates. Our episode begins with Dahlia holding the Kraken ribbon and saying that it works well. She starts thinking about other ways to use it then goes to the fridge and tries to magically repair it from the back. While doing so, she thinks about Wolf and hopes he's okay. Then something goes wrong with the fridge, causing everything inside to freeze.
The scene then shifts to Wolf, who tells his commander that they can't use fire and they're not in a place where the wind can easily reach them. It also seems that a goat has been taken from a nearby village, so it's only a matter of time before they start taking people. The commander tells him that he wishes he could take care of all of them, but it's very difficult, and they only have one option, to surround and attack these villains. Wolf suggests that he takes command and separates from the troops, and he will be able to lure the goblins, as he wants to finish this as quickly as possible. The commander agrees and tells him they will move at sunset. Then we see one of the soldiers telling the commander that Wolf's suggestion of this strategy means he has matured. The commander tells him that he will promote him to a leadership role in his unit. At night, Wolf hunts the goblins. They prepare dinner and drink the drink by the lighthouse. A group of soldiers talks, expressing their disbelief that Wolf was able to launch such an attack and defeat the goblins. They are eager to see what he will do next. The next morning, we see Wolf going to Dahlia carrying a box. She asks him what's inside, and we see that it's meat, fish, vegetables, fruits, cheese, and drinks. He brought her the box as a token of gratitude, and it's also equipped with a magical ice stone, so the food will stay fresh for a few days. He then enters the house and sees the fridge. Dahlia tells him that it's just a prototype, and its function is to freeze and preserve food. She plans to test it in her kitchen first, and if it succeeds, she will sell it. But the fridge is very heavy, so she intends to ask a friend in the transport guild to move it upstairs to the kitchen. Wolf offers to carry it, telling her it's very light, and he moves it upstairs. They sit down to talk, and Dahlia offers to prepare a drink. When she looks at the box, she is slightly surprised. Wolf tells her that these are drink glasses he brought her because she might need them during meals. Dahlia picks up one of the glasses and tells him that this is high-quality crystal infused with magic. She asks him about its cost, and Wolf tells her that these glasses weren't very expensive, costing him only four gold coins. Dahlia thanks him very much for these luxurious glasses. Wolf tells her that it's just a small token compared to the goggles she gave him, as they have been working very well without any problems so far. He suggests that she use them as a finished product, not a prototype. Dahlia tells him that as his friend, she prefers not to accept things without giving something in return. She then moves closer to him, thanks him for the gifts, and tells him that she would have sold him the goggles for two gold coins, but she will give them to him for free and take the wine glasses as payment. Wolf responds that he's happy to compensate her fairly for her wonderful skills. He then begins preparing the food, seasoning the meat, and grilling it. Wolf explains that they eat animals and monsters while camping, so he knows some basics of cooking. He then notices a bottle of soap foam and asks her what it is. She tells him it's another prototype she's working on and that she'll give it to her friends to test. She also mentions that she plans to work on creating a magic sword this evening, so she'll eat with him but won't drink after the meal. When the food is ready, they start eating, and Dahlia is amazed at how delicious the food tastes. Wolf credits the well-controlled heat of the stove for the tasty meal, telling her that her magical stove is amazing. He adds that if he had one like it during the campaigns, he believes many of his comrades would still be with him now. Dahlia then asks him if something bad happened, but he reassures her that it's not like that. He explains that some people left the unit because the food didn't suit them, and when he thinks about it, he feels regret. As they wait for the meat to finish grilling, they notice that it has shrunk to half its size. They start eating and comment on how delicious it looks. Dahlia then remarks that Wolf didn't eat any of the green peppers. He tells her that he doesn't like green peppers. With a teasing tone, she says that most children don't like green peppers. Hearing this, Wolf quickly starts eating all the peppers. Dahlia asks him to stop, but he insists on eating them all. Suddenly, he realizes that he has eaten all the peppers. Dahlia tells him that people's tastes change over time, so something he didn't like before might taste good to him now. He admits that they taste good and regrets missing out on them before. They continue eating, and when they finish, they decide to start crafting another magic sword. Wolf excitedly says he's been looking forward to this moment. Dahlia then asks him to separate the pieces of the sword and asks which magic would be better for the blade, durability magic or permanent sharpness magic. Wolf replies that short sword blades are usually thicker, so permanent sharpness magic would be the best choice. 
Dahlia then begins to infuse the sword with her magic, carefully adding all the magical elements until the sword is fully crafted. She also starts imbuing the scabbard with magic. Wolf observes that the scabbard seems to be absorbing more magic than the rest. Dahlia explains that adding a magic stone to the scabbard would render it unusable, so she extracts the magic from the stones and blends it into the scabbard, which takes more time. She also mentions that she's not very good at reducing weight, but her father excelled at it, and she recalls watching him do this when she was little. After they finish crafting the sword, Wolf checks on her, asking if she's tired. She assures him that she's fine, but admits that assembling all the parts of the sword requires physical strength. She asks him to put the pieces together. Wolf, testing the final weight, says that it's manageable, and then he uses his strength to slide the sword into its scabbard. However, the sword unexpectedly jumps out of his hands. Wolf, surprised, comments that he never imagined the pieces wouldn't fit together again. They realize that there might be another reason why people haven't succeeded in making such a sword before. It could be due to a magical incompatibility or that the magic alters the materials in some way. They acknowledge that they'll need to try several other methods and remark that their journey to create an extraordinary magic sword has just begun. As they continue working, they speculate that if the problem is due to magical incompatibility, it might mean that different types of magic conflict with each other. They begin to think and discuss the possibility of needing a material to separate each type of magic. Dahlia suddenly remembers a substance resistant to fire, water, and wind, which is also difficult to remove. She identifies it as black slime powder, which could be the solution they need. She notes that these gloves can withstand acid, and Wolf reassures her that if anything goes wrong, he'll use his strength to take her to the hospital immediately. Dahlia proceeds to coat the sword parts in the black slime powder and asks Wolf to assemble them again. This time the pieces fit together perfectly, and they successfully complete the magic dagger. They comment that it looks somewhat demonic, yet impressive, like something a demon king's servant or a powerful knight might wield. Wolf notes that it's now much easier to use, and all the different types of magic are functioning well within it. However, when he holds the dagger, he notices that his glove is starting to dissolve due to the sword's intense magic. Dahlia warns him that one wrong move could melt his hand. When they placed the piece of meat on the sword, it instantly withered. They then moved on to the next experiment. Wolf suggested using strong gloves to handle the sword, thinking they could withstand its effects. However, Dahlia insisted, no, we'll place it in a box that seals the magic and ask a specialist to dispose of it. But Wolf wanted to test it on at least one monster. He said, I understand it's very dangerous, but I want to keep it in the box to seal the magic and hold onto it for a while. It's our first magical sword, and I want to keep it as a memento. Dahlia replied, you mean as a keepsake? We'll call it the short sword of the demon king's servant. They then drank juice together. Wolf told her, Our next meeting will be after my upcoming campaign. In two days, we'll start hunting frogs as usual at this time of year. Their numbers are enormous. There were about 500 of them last year. But the worst part is the heat. Even though summer has just begun, it's unbearable because no winds blow in the swamp, and the heat becomes intolerable. Since we use fire magic for combat, our shoes get soaked. The smell is awful, and many soldiers end up with fungal infections. Dahlia asked, Don't you use drying magic on your filthy shoes? He replied, Unfortunately, no. We use hardening magic instead because we never know what we might step on. As he was leaving, she gave him a bag. He said, All right, I'll pay you for it next time. She responded, Instead of paying, give me a report on how the prototype performs. He said, All right, my dear. I'll write you a detailed report you can rely on. Then he gave her a small smile and left. Three weeks passed and we see him in another place where a commander whose name we later learn is Alethea asked him, Over the past three weeks, has anything interesting happened to you? He replied, No, the world is full of bad things and there's no enjoyment in it. She then asked about his health and he mentioned that after returning home from his leave, he met a wonderful woman. Alethea asked, A woman? It's rare for you to mention such things. Did you spend the night together? He replied, No, but we stayed up until dawn, having enjoyable conversations. She said, That means you found a good friend, 
You're very lucky to have met her. Wolf then left, and Alethea spoke to herself, saying, I wonder when he'll realize he's on the brink of catching a deadly fever. Will it pass in three days, or will it break him, or will it be something that takes him to the grave? I'm looking forward to finding out the answer. We didn't fully understand what Alethea meant by her words, but we'll learn more in time, my friends. The scene shifts to Wolf in the forest, where he takes off his boots and recalls Dahlia's words as she handed him a pair of socks. She had said, These are five-toed socks. They absorb sweat from your feet, so I thought they might make things better. I've infused them with drying magic. They have a unique design, don't they? I've never seen anything like them before and these undergarments are infused with wind magic. They're green because of the green slime powder. Are you planning to sell these somewhere? Wolf had asked. Dahlia replied, No, my father used to complain a lot, saying it was too hot in the summer and he didn't want to wear socks. So I created these prototypes to help him, but I didn't finish them until after he passed away. I never got the chance to give them to him. But since I've made them now, I'd be happy if you could use them, Wolf. We might even be able to prevent foot fungus. Back to the present, Wolf's friend notices and asks, What are those strange things? Wolf explains, They're five-toed socks, Etria. Each toe is separate from the others. And this undergarment is infused with drying magic. A friend gave them to me when I mentioned how damp the swamp is. I'm trying them out now, and they're quite nice. My feet aren't sweating anymore. His friend is surprised, exclaiming, No way! My feet are always drenched in sweat. Wolf offers, Do you want to try them? His friend eagerly accepts, and after trying them on, he's thrilled, saying, These are amazing. My feet aren't sweating anymore, and it's great that we have the same size. At that moment, their commander approaches and overhears them talking about foot fungus. Wolf explains, yes, I think wearing these socks and innerwear might help prevent it. The commander asks, where can you buy those? Wolf responds, these are just prototypes, but I have more if you'd like to try them. Soon, others come over, wanting to try them as well, even offering to pay for them later. As they jokingly argue about foot fungus, one of them says that as people get older, they're more prone to such infections but they'll eventually go away as immunity decreases with age. Amidst the banter, Wolf's friend Randolph also asks for a pair of those socks if possible. The group expresses their eagerness to have them, and Wolf is overjoyed that things have gotten out of hand in a good way. He starts to wonder if Dahlia might become very wealthy from this, and whether she could produce many of these and become one of the richest people in town. Stay tuned for the next episode to find out more, but don't forget to subscribe to the channel and hit the bell icon so you don't miss anything new. Our episode today begins with this great battle where Wolf was in the army, fighting against those wild, savage frogs. It was a very tough day. The battle lasted for about four hours. At night, the weather was bitterly cold. Everyone was talking to Wolf, and one of them said, I couldn't shake off all the worry about foot fungus. Wolf was taking notes on everything they said. They were all praising the socks Wolf had distributed to them, saying they didn't slip even when they stepped on them, and that their feet didn't develop rashes or itchiness. These socks were truly rare. However, some of them mentioned that the heels needed reinforcement and that it would be excellent if the socks reached the knees. Wolf took these notes to report back to Dahlia. They also wanted different sizes. The scene then shifts to Wolf when he was with Dahlia requesting a large quantity of socks and drying inner soles. He wanted to place the order immediately. Dahlia was surprised and said, So soon? I only asked for a report on your experience. Wolf replied that he had the report with him and handed her most of the papers, except for the last one, which was their execution plan. He then informed her that many of the men were concerned about foot fungus, especially during the midday when the weather was extremely hot and they sweat a lot. However, after trying those socks... They were very grateful and requested more. This report is full of admiration for the idea and the skill that made it a reality, he added. Dahlia then asked, Is this your handwriting, Wolf? He told her that as the unit's representative, he was allowed to record their collective opinion. She said, These are a lot of requests, but how can I fulfill all of them? I think I'll go to the Trade Guild tomorrow to seek advice. Wolf told her that he would accompany her since his commander wanted the order as soon as possible. Wolf wants to help in any way he can. I'll accompany you everywhere. 
although this could have dire consequences. It might lead to rumors of improper behavior between us. I mean rumors of a relationship between us. It might be better for me to maintain a certain distance when we're in public so that no one talks about us. She told him that she didn't care about such things and didn't care about people's opinions of her. She knew herself well, and most people knew that she was a girl with a good reputation and acknowledged her successes. However, if you prefer to change the way we interact, Wolf, I have no right to stop you. If that's what you want to do, don't hesitate to tell me, he replied. I'm sorry, Dahlia, I can't change our relationship, nor do I want to, but I'm very worried about you. I don't want anyone to speak a single word against you, Dahlia was very happy and said. In that case, you should stay very close to me because I enjoy working with you. I will do my best to ensure that our friendship is not a source of embarrassment for you. The scene then shifts to when Wolf and Dahlia arrived at the trade guild, where they met with the deputy head of the guild, Gabriella Gator. She had learned that Wolf wanted to become one of the guarantors in the Rossetti Company, which belonged to Dahlia. Ivano, the blonde-haired young man, said, I will prepare everything for you. Meanwhile, Gabriella asked Dahlia to have a private conversation and requested that she accompany her to her office. While Wolf met with Dominic, who was finalizing some papers for him, he explained the procedures and how things would proceed. He also asked Wolf if he planned to continue his work as a knight while also acting as a guarantor, recommending that he inform the Scalverado family of his intentions, meaning he should inform his family about these matters. This was to account for any future complications. Additionally, it was said that victory favors the one who takes the initiative. The scene then shifts to Dahlia with the deputy head, who informed her that the guild had received a message from the commander of the monster suppression forces, saying that he would send someone and requested a meeting. Dahlia replied, These matters are not important to me, but tell me more about the details of the other work. I want to make a large quantity of five-finger drying socks and some insoles, but I'm unsure about the quantities for large orders. Gabriella asked her, How much can you infuse with magic in a day? Dahlia responded, Fifteen or twenty at most. Can I prepare more than that on my own? Gabriella then said, In that case, we will need to hire another person. They are striving to increase production in the early stages, utilizing cobblers to manufacture the inner souls. The finished goods will then need to be delivered to the trade guild. Fortunato then states that Rossetti Company's share in the profit agreement would be 20% of any net profit. However, Gabriella interjects, saying that the trade guild would prefer a 25% share. Jam steps in, pointing out that they should consider the time the clothing guild would invest in this, suggesting that 20% should be sufficient. He also requests that they send reports on the quantities produced and asks Rossetti Company to prioritize which customers would receive their products first. He isn't sure if this will suit the head of the Rossetti Company, but Wilford finds all the terms acceptable and says, why not? Fortunato then mentions that the Rossetti Company could appoint a supervisor for the work if they wish. They ask about using green slime for the inner soles and how many pairs can be made from one slime. Dahlia replies that one small slime is enough to prepare five pairs, meaning they would need 200 slimes to produce a thousand sets. Given their good relations with the Rossetti family in the past, during the days of Mr. Carlo, when they were sent to acquire Kraken and Sand Lizards, these current capabilities are much greater. Everyone is excited due to the anticipation. Dahlia expresses that she and her father are deeply indebted to them for everything they have done. We then see Dahlia thanking Lucia, who replies, what were you thinking by sending an envoy from the clothing guild? My father almost fainted. Lucia's mother told her, You're the one who created this, then made me assistant manager on the spot. The workshop is just us five family members. Dahlia responds, I didn't think all this would happen because of that. I only made it to amuse Mr. Carlo. Lucia then asks Dahlia if she can send some raincoat fabric by carriage, as she wanted to make some cute coats, but had no idea when she would have the time. The scene then shifts to Wolf telling Dahlia, I'm glad things seem to be going well now, but I think you should learn to avoid dealing with nobles. Dahlia angry asks, Did I disrespect anyone with my words? Wolf explains that she told Mr. Fortunato that she trusted him and left everything to him. When an unmarried lady says that to a nobleman, it can be understood as a declaration of love, he says. Dahlia responds, I meant that I trust the way he works, so I decided to leave those decisions to him. Wolf reassures her, saying he knows she isn't a noble and that he will intervene if anything happens, so there's no need to worry. Dahlia, feeling sad, says, How could I be so tactless? I didn't know any of this. I'm very upset. The scene shifts to Gabriella, where Ivano apologizes to her, saying, I prioritized my interests as a guarantor for the Rossetti Company over the interests of the trade guild. 
please accept my resignation from my position in the guild. Gabriella responds, although this happened sooner than I expected, I didn't know this was the reason. Ivano replies, I thought I would finish my career here under your supervision. Gabriella then asks, but you're giving that up for Dahlia? Ivano laughs and says, no, I'm doing it for my own sake. I love being a merchant. Gabriella is pleased and says, I can't argue with that after seeing that smile on your face. But before you leave your job here, why don't you ask Dahlia if she would hire you? He tells her, that wouldn't be fair at all. Let me write my resignation letter here. He hands his resignation to Gabriella and asks, won't you accept my resignation? She tells him, Dahlia has refused your request. You need to talk to Wolf first. If he recommends you, Dahlia won't be able to refuse. You can take the opportunity to see what kind of man he is on my behalf. They laugh together. After that, Ivano goes to Mr. Wolf and asks him what he thinks of Miss Dahlia. Wolf replies that she is an amazing magical artisan and a dear friend, but asks what that has to do with being a guarantor for the Rossini Company. Ivano then tells him, You are standing exactly where Mr. Carlo passed away. I met him here, but there was nothing I could do. Wolf thanks him for sharing such information. Ivano then says, No, perhaps I told you this just to see your reaction. To me, Miss Dahlia seems like a very beautiful girl dressed in golden elegance. I believe the Rossini Company is capable of achieving great things, and I want to stand by Miss Dahlia's side and help her grow the company. I just submitted my resignation to the Trade Guild. Wolf asks him, And why are you telling me this? Ivano responds, I hope that you will recommend me to her, Mr. Wolf. The reason is that I am the eldest son of a long-established trading company. I worked in the guild for 16 years, and I am proud of my skills in trading and managing my company. We lost everything during my father's days, and I sought refuge in the royal capital as if trying to escape from that. I found work here in the guild, which I had to do. Miss Dahlia's company is extremely appealing, but how can a trading company exist without a single merchant? The market would devour it instantly, and I cannot bear that. Wolf then asks, And despite all that, you don't have your own company? Ivano replies, She dreams golden dreams that might have the power to change the world. There isn't a merchant in this world who wouldn't be drawn to that. So is there a way you would recommend me to her? Wolf responds, Promise me two things first. We will use oath magic in the church to make it binding. The first is that you will not intentionally harm Dahlia or her company. The second promise is that you will protect Dahlia above all else. If something happens, her safety takes priority over the company and everything else. Ivano gladly agrees to these conditions and promises to protect her. After that, Wolf gives him a gold coin to make the necessary preparations. Ivano is overjoyed when he sees the gold coin, holding it in his hand and says, This is a gold coin minted in commemoration of the coronation. Wolf tells him, I've heard that changing professions requires money, so take this, but please don't tell Dahlia. Ivano accepts the money without any reservations. And from now on, call me Ivano. The scene then shifts to Dahlia with Gabriella, where Dahlia thanks her for her guidance the previous night, saying that without her, she wouldn't have known what to do. Gabriella apologizes because the foaming bottle she used was so amazing that she recommended it to a friend who has now placed an order for a bottle which will make them very busy. Dahlia thanks her again and expresses her deep gratitude. Gabriella then informs her that a request has arrived from the president of Orlando Trading Company, and as the head of the Rossini Company, he asks her to be a distributor. She suggests that Dahlia meet with him as he wants to apologize. The scene then transitions to Dahlia and Gabriella with the president of Orlando Trading Company. He apologizes to Dahlia for what happened in the past and presents her with 12 gold coins as a token of his regret and apology. Dahlia accepts them, and he hopes she will not sue Tobias for recording the magical device. In exchange, he offers to provide her with the materials she needs for her work over the next three years. Dahlia agrees on the condition that he supplies her with fairy crystals as soon as possible. The president agrees, and then Gabriella leaves them. The president then presents Dahlia with a gift to compensate for the trouble he caused her. The gift is a horn from a female unicorn, which can be used to neutralize any poison and relieve any pain. Dahlia accepts the gift and thanks him. The scene then shifts to Guido, who is with Wolf, and that's how today's episode of this anime ends. To watch more upcoming episodes, please subscribe to the channel and activate the notification bell.
Today's episode begins with Guido sitting with Wilfried as they discuss matters of the city. Guido mentions that his father was summoned to the royal palace early in the morning, but he was quite upset because he couldn't see Wilfried. He isn't sure if he can fill in for his father or not. Wilfried reassures him that he doesn't mind going in his place, as he wanted to talk to him because he recently became a guarantor for the Rossetti Company and will soon start working with the Monster Suppression Forces. Guido is delighted to hear that his brother Wilfried has made such great connections. He then informs him that their father asked him to tell Wilfried that this villa, along with all its staff, is at his disposal, as he pleases. Their father wouldn't mind at all if he used them to assist the Rossetti Company. Additionally, if Wilfried needs water or ice stones, he can help with that as well. Guido then asks Wilfried to let him know if he faces any difficulties with anything else. Guido continues, saying that he heard this is the first time Wilfried has tried to reach out to their father because he was troubled and couldn't solve his problem. Wilfried responds by saying he doesn't think they have any memories of talking together. Their father allows them to live without worrying about food, shelter, and clothing and he also permitted Wilfried to join the monster suppression forces. That's more than enough for him. Guido then asks if Wilfried is thinking of leaving the Scalverda family in the future. Wilfried replies that he wants to become independent someday, but this company is not related to that at all. Guido asks if he's ever considered working outside the monster suppression forces, and Wilfried replies that he hasn't thought about it before. Guido realizes that Wilfried doesn't intend to leave the Crimson Shields, which annoys Wilfried because he feels Guido meddles in everything and treats him like a little brother. Wilfried asks him why he does that, and Guido apologizes, admitting that he knows Wilfried avoids him often. Guido says he may have used the lack of opportunities to talk as an excuse to run away from him until now. Guido then remembers when he was with their mother in the carriage as they were traveling through the forest. They were attacked by a group of bandits. Guido wanted to go out and fight them, but his mother didn't want him to leave her side so he wouldn't get hurt. At that moment, Wilfried and his men arrived. When Wilfried saw them, he rushed to fight the bandits and ended up killing them all. Then we return to the present, where Guido tells Wilfried that he has regretted what happened that day all this time. If Wilfried and Lady Vanessa hadn't protected him, he and his mother would have been dead. However, he feels guilty for not being able to save Vanessa and his mother. He apologizes to Wilfried for what happened, but Wilfried asks him to hold his head high because there is nothing to apologize for. Guido replies that if he had fought alongside him, perhaps Lady Vanessa wouldn't have died. He feels he should have died protecting them both. Wilfried firmly tells him never to say such things and that he should repay Lady Vanessa's sacrifice in the right way, urging Guido to take back his words. Guido apologizes and withdraws what he said. Guido then expresses that he feels Wilfried hates him and that avoiding him was only natural. But Wilfried reassures him that he never hated him or tried to avoid him. They just never had the chance to spend time together. Guido continues talking about what happened in the past with their mother. He tells Wilfried that on that day, he was paralyzed with fear when he decided to fight. He clung to his spot to protect his mother and couldn't leave her side. By the time he stepped out of the carriage, everything was already over, thanks to Wilfred and Lady Vanessa. He then confesses that he still sees Lady Vanessa and the knights who died that day in his dreams. Wilfred is surprised, because he also dreams about them. He suggests they find a way to deal with this, and Guido laughs along with him, saying that he should get married. It might not completely rid him of the nightmares, but he believes it will help. Guido then asks Wilfried to allow him to make up for what happened before. He insists that if anything comes up related to work or the palace, Wilfried should come to him immediately. Wilfried thanks him and admits that he doesn't know much about business relations, but appreciates Guido's advice and willingness to help. Wilfried then asks for materials that could be used to imbue objects with magic. You Guido responds, I will provide you with all the gene crystals I can. If I find anything else, I will send it to you quickly. In the meantime, you should try talking to our father. I feel bad that I only visit him a few times a year, and I think our father visits Lady Vanessa's grave every month. Wilfried silently reflects, hoping that Guido's nightmares about that day will disappear. He thinks to himself, the nightmares that haunted my sleep for so many years have not returned even once since the day I met her. 
The scene then shifts to Dahlia, who is speaking with Fermo in Gandolfi's workshop. Fermo greets them warmly, and Dahlia explains that the product she wanted his opinion on is this soap dispenser. It's just ordinary soap and water, she says. Fermo suggests it could be used for washing the face and hands, in barbershops or even as a children's toy, indicating its potential for various uses. Dahlia tells him that those who tested it for her said it was useful for shaving facial hair. Fermo decides he wants to try it out and asks them to have Ivano assist him. The lady suggests that since he has the opportunity, he might as well tidy up his appearance. After using the soap, Fermo is very pleased with it. Dahlia then hands him the documentation with all the specifications. Fermo responds, We would like you to expedite production in the first month if possible. The lady states, We will need more than 1,500 bottles per month. For every 200 bottles, you will receive two gold pieces and three large silver pieces. Fermo agrees to work with them, but notes, If we're making it for shaving, this head is too small for men's faces, and a larger head would make it easier to use for children and the elderly. If it's going to be placed somewhere where many people use it, this project has nothing to do with the joint development mentioned in your letter. Dahlia replies, I want you to work with me to improve this bottle. If the improved version hits the market, I'd be happy to draft a profit-sharing contract with our names on it. Fermo, surprised, says, You can hire me to fix certain parts if you want to make improvements, but there's no point in putting our names together in the contract. This seems like your way of showing pity for our workshop. The lady responds, As I mentioned in the letter, I'm looking for a talented, promising craftsman to collaborate on joint developments. If you're a co-developer, that means both of us will contribute ideas and we'll start by making what we can. If the result is good, it will become our next product. Dahlia agrees, saying, I will cover the cost of the materials and labor required for the first prototype. Fermo replies, I don't need any of that. Don't consider me a co-developer. Instead, I would prefer if you asked our workshop to manufacture any new products. Dahlia, now irritated, responds, I don't agree with that. If we're going to create something together, then let me include your name as a partner. Fermo insists, all the fame and profits should go to the original inventor. Dahlia admits, I'm new to this, so I didn't realize it. I'll register it as a new product under your name, and I apologize for asking to put a novice like me in the contract alongside you. Fermo, now angry, says, I didn't create the original item, so I don't want to earn any money from a profit-sharing contract. While our workshop is facing some difficulties, I won't accept charity from anyone. Dahlia, feeling frustrated, says, That wasn't my intention, but when you took apart the components of that bottle, many ideas must have come to your mind. The story continues with Dahlia reflecting on the users of the product and what would make them happy. She mentions to Fermo that when he looked at the bottle there was a sparkle in his eyes something she aspires to as a professional. Firmo asks if she wants to collaborate with him because of his experience as a craftsman. Dahlia agrees, and Firmo tells her he has one condition. His name must be included in the contract as a co-developer. He promises that this will motivate him to create something one day that will earn them a lot of money. Dahlia agrees to the arrangement, and they shake hands to seal the deal. Later that night, we see Dahlia using her magic on a necklace to increase its durability, and she succeeds. Meanwhile, Wilfried is seen outside Dahlia's home. She steps out to greet him, and he apologizes for coming without an appointment. He hands her his mother's book, which contains her notes on the etiquette of noble conversation, something that would be very useful for Dahlia. They enter the house, and Wilfried notices an injury on Dahlia's leg. He also sees a bruise on her face and a medical bandage on her neck. Concerned, he asks her who did this to her. Dahlia explains that it wasn't caused by anyone else she was trying to infuse magic using a skull or skull artifact, and the magic backfired, pushing her backward. This reassures Wilfried, and they continue into the house. Dahlia goes on to explain that she infused a bracelet with a skull fang because the fangs have an effect on wind magic. However, when used as a material for magic infusion, it requires a massive amount of magical energy. She had secretly experimented with this before and had drained her magic to the point of almost losing consciousness. Despite this, she repeated the reckless act, though it wasn't as dangerous as it was four years ago. She recounts how she attempted the experiment in her room, 
At first, infusing the bracelet with magic seemed easier than before, but suddenly it felt like her magic was being drained rapidly. After successfully completing the infusion, she wore the bracelet and transferred some magic into it, which resulted in her being thrown to the ground, causing her injuries. Wilfried Wilfried gives her two options, either she drinks a potion or he takes her to the church immediately. Dahlia insists that it's not as serious as he thinks and adds that before making the bracelet, she created the necklace with the help of a unicorn's horn. Wilfried then asks her to come with him somewhere, which makes Dahlia nervous, so she quickly agrees to drink the potion and does so. Wilfried promises to bring her more potions next time. But Dahlia apologizes for making him worry but Wilfried tells her not to apologize and to be more careful in the future. He then asks her what she plans to do with the bracelet. She responds that she will keep it, as adding any type of magic to it would lead to great danger. Wilfried then requests to buy the bracelet from her because he wants to experiment with it for some time. And with that, our episode concludes. To stay updated with future episodes, please subscribe to the channel and activate the notification bell to receive the latest updates. Our episode begins with Dahlia telling Wolf that she is confident the bracelet will be fine with him and asks him to take good care of it. Wolf then asks her if applying a blood bond to the bracelet will help him fly, and Dahlia informs him that he can do it without any external magical energy. Wolf tells her to do it for him, and he will offer something in return for the bracelet. He explains that by training his physical abilities, he will be able to benefit from it greatly. Right now, all he can do is jump up and come down, and if he uses the enhancement magic, he will be fine if he falls. Dahlia responds that she can't use him as a test subject, but Wolf says he wants to see how the bracelet works, and they will test the interaction between the enhancement magic and the school's fangs. Dahlia agrees to the experiment, but will not accept payment for the bracelet. The experiment begins, and we see Wolf dropping a drop of blood from his hands onto the bracelet. Dahlia then uses her magic, causing the blood to merge with the bracelet, and hands it back to Wolf, telling him that he now owns it. Wolf puts it on, thanks her profusely, and they go outside to test it. When Wolf tries to fly, he succeeds and finds it very enjoyable, feeling his strength has increased. He is able to jump easily and continues flying repeatedly. Dahlia tells him to stop and land so that no one sees him. Wolf lands on the ground and asks Dahlia to sell him the bracelet officially. Dahlia informs him that the bracelet is a token of gratitude because it has guaranteed her company's success by enabling her to achieve impossible feats. Wolf says that if that's the case, it will be a net loss for her. Dahlia responds that he should give her two doses in return. Wolf then advises her not to conduct any dangerous experiments alone, as it would be terrible if something happened while she was by herself. Dahlia agrees and also mentions that the front gate can only be opened by those who are magically registered. Wolf suggests that she should register as well, if she doesn't mind, and Dahlia agrees, feeling reassured by the idea. They then move inside the house, where Dahlia is seen registering Wolf on the screen, with Wolf placing his hands on the magical screen. With that, Wolf was officially registered as magical, and he thanked Dahlia for it. Dahlia told him that she felt reassured now because if anything bad were to happen to her, she would alert the guards who would immediately inform Wolf. Dahlia then opened a book on noble etiquette and started reading the instructions on how to deal with nobility aloud. Wolf interrupted her, asking her to stop reading it out loud. Dahlia apologized, and as she was doing so, the doorbell rang. Dahlia went to see who was outside and found Marcella at the gate. She asked him what brought him here, and he informed her that he had brought her a box of delicious oysters. Dahlia was very pleased and thanked him. He offered to bring it inside, but Dahlia said she would do it herself since she had guests inside. Dahlia went back inside and placed the oysters in front of Wolf, asking if he liked oysters. Wolf replied that he loved them very much and they decided to have dinner together with drinks. Dahlia agreed and soon brought the food, which looked very delicious. They began eating, and Wolf complimented the food, saying it was so good he almost wanted to eat the pan itself. Dahlia told him that eating directly from the pan wasn't polite. After finishing the main course, they started on the appetizers and drank some juice. Dahlia mentioned that the drink was given to her by Lady Alicia, the queen's sister, as the queen loved the drink, and sent it to her sister frequently. Dahlia enjoyed it, 
very much. Wolf laughed and commented that she drank like a squirrel and wished he had more of that drink. He said it was so good that he wished they had brandy glasses. He wanted to buy some, but only after their company's matters settled. Dahlia mentioned that she had a meeting with Mr. Ravano tomorrow to discuss their future plans. She expressed her gratitude for working with Wolf, even though their first project was a bit challenging. She was confident it would help many people. Then Dahlia asked Wolf if any countermeasures, like purification magic, had been applied to their shoes. Wolf replied that he hadn't heard of anyone using such measures, as leather shoes don't dry quickly, so he tries not to wash them often. Dahlia was surprised, suggesting that they could use a dryer. Wolf noted that heat could damage the leather, so Dahlia adjusted the dryer to lower the temperature, ensuring that if the airflow was warmer than a hand's touch, it wouldn't harm the leather. Wolf asked her to think of something to make the airflow reach the toes, and Dahlia thought of using a hose and connecting it to a water heater. Then Dahlia added holes along the length of the dryer so that the airflow would reach every part of the shoes. Wolf was thrilled with the idea, and they proceeded to implement it. In the end, the idea was successful, and the shoes were undamaged. Wolf talked to Dahlia and told her that if they had one of these dryers, everyone would be able to use it. Dahlia responded, asking him to use it carefully to avoid any damage and to clean their toes thoroughly to prevent any fungal infections. Wolf made a note of these recommendations to share with his friends. He then mentioned that he knew a lot about dryers from his previous life, which delighted Dahlia. She asked him to share any ideas he knew, and she told him she would go to Mr. Ivano to discuss everything and seek his advice. The scene shifts to Mr. Ivano, where Dahlia tells him about her invention. Ivano thanked her for coming to him first and expressed his gratitude. Dahlia mentioned her concern about the invention being sold, but Ivano assured her that he would promote it with all his resources. Given the market he had in mind, he was confident they could achieve significant profits. He then asked her about the time she spent developing the dryer. Dahlia replied that she had developed it the previous day and estimated that it took about 30 minutes, including all safety procedures. Ivano asked if she had any other products she was thinking of creating so he could prepare himself and think of future sales strategies. Dahlia mentioned that she wanted to reduce the size of the magical stove and make its waterproof fabric lighter. The only product she had made a prototype for so far was a refrigerator with a connected freezer. She also wanted to create a magical device for drying clothes and a pot that could assist with cooking. Additionally, she was considering making a home heater for winter, but did not want to sell it. Ivano asked her to leave the production and sales arrangements to him, assuring her he would register and sell every product. He also advised her not to tell anyone about the fake magic sword. Dahlia became quite worried because she was referring to creating magical weaponry. Ivano reassured her that it wasn't a problem. He explained that if she made any wrong moves, she could be kidnapped by bad people. However, if her magical swords reached a level where they could significantly increase military power, it was entirely possible. In such a case, they would be sent to countries with fewer sorcerers. Dahlia responded that she hadn't thought about it so deeply. She also mentioned that she had created a magical device infused with wind magic, which had a blood bond applied to it so that only Wolf could use it. However, it could still be used in combat. Ivano said it was fine as long as only a specific person could use it. He assured her that if she was worried about anything, that was why he was there. Dahlia expressed her concern about bothering him too much. Ivano then gave her a copy of the oath she had sworn before the church, asking her to keep it. He believed it would help her feel more comfortable assigning tasks to him and wanted her to feel free to create whatever she wanted. Dahlia promised to keep it safe and said she would ensure it remained secure. Ivano looked forward to seeing her register more products than Mr. Carlo had. He then proceeded to prepare the necessary paperwork for her new magical device. The scene shifts to Gabriella, who tells Dahlia that Ivano had checked everything and she didn't expect any errors. Gabriella assured her that Ivano had chosen this timing himself and could handle matters that Dahlia wasn't skilled at. Dahlia replied that she felt bad about being a company president who couldn't handle everything, but it was too late for that now. Dahlia then asked Gabriella to clear her parents' debt, saying that she would repay her no matter how many years it took. 
Gabriella responded that the situation was more complicated than Dahlia had been told. She remembered what Dahlia's father had said. When Gabriella mentioned that if Dahlia ever faced problems as a magical artisan or as a woman, she should seek advice, it was clear that Dahlia was the type who would prefer to repay her debts on her own. Returning to the present, Gabriella said almost prophetically that Dahlia should not feel indebted to her any longer. She added that she would continue working as she had before, and if Dahlia believed she could repay her debt, she was welcome to do so. She was wel At that moment, Ivano entered and announced that the Marquis Grat, the leader of the Beast Suppression Forces, had sent an envoy to meet with the head of the Rossetti Company. The envoy, Deputy Commander Griselda, conveyed a message from Commander Grat, stating that a verbal response would suffice. The envoy asked if they could provide the response there. Dahlia thanked the envoy for delivering the message, which contained an invitation to the palace. Dahlia agreed to the invitation. Ivano then mentioned that the palace preferred to work according to a tighter schedule. Gabriella responded that they were in a hurry and wanted to see her urgently. She requested Ivano to accompany Dahlia to the palace as her escort. The next day, Dahlia and Ivano prepared to go to the palace. Dahlia told Ivano that she would rely on him a lot. The episode ends with this scene. And the Animize closing message invites viewers to stay tuned for upcoming episodes and to subscribe and activate the notification bell to receive all the latest updates. Our episode begins with Dahlia greeting Wolf, who informs her that he hasn't been here in a long time. Dahlia asks him about his journey and Wolf tells her about a pack of escaped monsters that were hunting the neighboring village's sheep. These monsters ended up injuring some children while they were hunting them down, but everything ended well. Dahlia asks if the injured children are okay, and Wolf assures her that all injuries caused by the monster's magic have healed. He mentions that the bracelet she gave him helped when the abducted children fell from the sky. Without it, he wouldn't have been able to reach them in time. Dahlia is relieved to hear this, and suggests they continue working on the magic sword prototype. Due to the black slime incident last time, they ended up with a short sword that they couldn't wield barehanded. This time, they will try the yellow slime, known as earth magic, which Wolf explains gradually dissolves metal over time. Dahlia confirms this, but notes that unlike the black slime, once turned into powder, it loses its dissolving properties. She advises Wolf to wear a mask and gloves during the experiment. They proceed by placing the yellow slime in water, Wolf stirring it while Dahlia infuses magic with the sword. After finishing the experiment, they produce a sword. Wolf holds it and mentions that the sword's scabbard doesn't repel water and feels heavier, likely due to earth magic. They realize the attempt failed and should try other materials next time. Dahlia suggests using a single horned horn and will try sprinkling a little of its powder next time. Wolf reflects that their first attempt at making the sword wasn't entirely bad. Despite being their first try, they succeeded in producing, assembling, and activating it. If they could just touch that sword with their hands, it means their approach wasn't wrong. Even if the approach wasn't wrong, it's still safe to say it was unsafe. Dahlia suggests using the yellow slime solution on the short sword belonging to the Demon King. But then they place the sword in the yellow slime solution, and when they finish crafting the sword, they put a piece of meat on it to see if it's safe to touch. Nothing happens to the piece of meat, so Wolf picks up the sword and finds it amazing. He tells Dahlia that there's no problem. The sword repels water and the scabbard is very light. Their experiment finally succeeds. Dahlia then suggests there's no issue with trying the experiment on a long sword. Suddenly, they see the sword moving on its own as if it were a living creature. Dahlia explains that this is due to the conflict between the types of magic. Wolf asks her if it's possible for magical devices to develop something like their own spirit. Dahlia tells him she's heard such myths from people, but she doesn't believe them. Then we see Dahlia carrying a box and Wolf asks her what it is. She tells him it's the scales of the mirror snake, effective in deceiving the eye. It's very beautiful and one of her customers sent it to her as a thank you for her magical products. It has a beautiful shine and she believes it to be from a rainbow snake, a very rare monster. It's said that a lamp infused with one of its scales allows the user to see the future, which is useful for escaping from monsters. Dahlia then thinks of using this item in her magical devices. As she touches it, suddenly the stone melts, emitting a very bright light. We then see Dahlia in a beautiful dress surrounded by many people. 
Wolf approaches her and invites her to dance. They start dancing together, filled with joy. Suddenly, they return to reality and find themselves on the ground. They awaken, realizing they were in a dream, but they don't quite understand what happened. Dahlia tells herself that if this was a scale from the rainbow snake and not the mirror snake, then what just happened might have been a glimpse of the future. A wolf then offers to dance with her, but Dahlia tells him that there's no need for that, as what happened was just an illusion. Wolf insists that it was surely a glimpse of the future. That night, Wolf leaves the tower and returns to his home. The next morning, we see Dahlia with Ivano and Gabriella. Gabriella asks her about her relationship with Wolf, and Dahlia replies that things between them are normal. Gabriella then asks, hasn't he proposed to you yet? Dahlia explains that while she values the idea of marriage, she isn't thinking about romance or marriage at the moment. Gabriella advises her that if Wolf proposes, she should accept. After Dahlia leaves, Ivano tells Gabriella that the son of the Earl has moved to live in the town. He wonders if he can propose to the daughter of a merchant family, but notes that it would be difficult, especially since his family is about to become a Marquis in the near future, which would lead to a lot of jealousy and troubles. All the troubles would be directed toward the woman. Ivano then asked Gabriella, if the merchant expanded her company and became an official supplier to the palace, or if she got a high-ranking noble as a guardian, or if she became a baroness, would Wolf be able to marry her? Gabriella replied that she thought it might be possible in that case. Ivano responded, saying that he considered that the least of his goals for the company's future plans. The scene then shifts to Dahlia, who went to the tavern to meet her friends. She apologized for being late. Her friend Irma told her that she had become very beautiful, to which Dahlia thanked her. Irma also complimented her for being very elegant. Irma then happily mentioned that Marcella had bought her the dress. Marcella was praised for his elegance as well. They all sat down to eat, and Dahlia expressed her gratitude to them for standing by her when she broke off her engagement and for being her guarantors. They also helped sell their new socks. Irma responded that they didn't do much, and being guarantors was in their own interest. Thanks to Dahlia, Lucia was able to gather the funds needed for her workshop quickly. Dahlia then invited them to eat and drink as they pleased. In celebration of the founding of the Rosti Company, Irma's beauty salon, and the prosperity of Lucia's workshop, everyone continued to eat and drink until they finished. Dahlia then returned to her room to sleep and dreamt of her father when she was a child. He spoke to her for a while, explaining that he would think of things and then create them, but he could never see an end to it. However, he was confident that his daughter would be able to achieve that. Dahlia asked him about the magical device he had created, and then she woke up from her dream. Early the next morning, Dahlia went with Wolf to the cemetery to visit their parents' graves. Wolf handed her a bouquet of flowers, and when they arrived at the cemetery, they separated to visit their respective graves. We then see Wolf standing before his mother's grave, placing the bouquet of flowers upon it. We see Wolf standing in front of his mother's grave, speaking to her. I've missed you so much. I spoke to talk to you. I'm sure you would scold me. I've met a friend I wish to protect. He made magical weapons to protect me. But now, all I do is cause her trouble. I hope that one day, I'll be able to protect her. Then we see Dahlia at her father's grave, saying, but if you saw how things turned out, I'm sure you wouldn't be angry with me. I've also established Rossetti Company. Mr. Ivano joined the company, and he helps me a lot. It seems that my first products were five-toed socks and drying slippers, but people are very pleased with them. I originally made them for you. I didn't know you had the habit of making people owe you favors. And Mr. Oswald. There may be others I'm unaware of. You were always lenient and indifferent about everything. Acting nobly away from my eyes wasn't fair. But we then return to Wolf, who tells his mother, You once asked me what kind of knight I wanted to become. I always thought you were asking about speed or strength or my fighting style. What I want is to be a knight who can protect those he wishes to protect. That may be the wrong answer as a knight, but it's my wish. Someone dies while protecting another. They continue to protect the ones they love even after death. 
I've chosen to believe that and to be able to protect myself, saying to her father, I'm glad you took care of me. If that continued, I'd always be artisan. I lack magical strength and technical skills, but I want to become a magic artisan who surpasses even you. I now have dear friends who support me, and I'm no longer alone. And one day I'll become a better magic artisan than even you were. After that, she meets Wolf, who asks her where she's going. She replies, I'm heading to the trade guild. I can't take something that might be considered a monster to the guild. He tells her, people might start calling it the crawling magic sword. Someone might even we created such a monster. This is how the anime ends. Stay tuned for new animes, and don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell so you don't miss anything new.